Uh, welcome everyone. I, I guess some of you know that until the beginning of this year, for the last 17 years, I was the chairman of Space Agency. And therefore, I, have, uh, I feel some very close to this subject. And uh, as chairman of Space Agency, former chairman of Space Agency, and as the director of the Cyber Research Center here at uh, Tel Aviv University, you cannot, uh, uh, I mean, you cannot allow yourself uh, not looking seriously at the subject you are going to discuss. Um, uh, electronic cyber defense in space. I would say not in space, but for space or something like this. Uh, one cannot uh, um, avoid observing that a lot of uh, uh, cyber vulnerability of space assets is on the ground. Um, uh, I mean, most of space activities, space assets cannot work with some dialogue, command, con uh, control, uh, data, etc., with the ground. And therefore, the way to uh, uh, use cyber, cyber technology against space assets is much wider than only in space. But nevertheless, this is uh, something we should pay attention to. I don't know say today, except very few cases like the first two days of the Ukraine uh, uh, war with Russia, etc., I don't know why it, uh, um, uh, we don't see, like in, we see in other areas, daily attacks on uh, space assets. But this is this is fact of life. I hope it will stay like this. But living in Israel, knowing all the time that there are always big bad guys somewhere, um, I, I know that this hope is baseless. One day will come, and we will have to invest much more in uh, space, in cybersecurity of space assets than we do today. I think this that's why this uh, uh, session event we call the whole uh, cyber week. We call it a conference. You know? we cannot say this conference event in the conference uh, uh, will begin. Uh, a series of uh, discussions involving, as we usually would like to to have, communities coming from academy, industry, users, uh, developers, all the relevant uh, communities. I don't. I mean, you you are already here, so uh, I, I I will not tell you. But usually, people, everyone is using space assets every day. But people are not aware of it. They, when I tell them, when they sit uh, in the evening to to listen to CNN from uh, from uh, abroad or something like this, most of the time they, without knowing it, they use some space communication because we in Israel, you know, we don't have enough some money tables. Or when they hear uh, in the morning when they hear that uh, uh, the weather will be like this and that, there will be rain, no rain, etc. It's based on some uh, uh, space uh, meteorological satellites, etc. People usually don't realize it. I guess this is not the case with you, otherwise you will not be here. Uh, but this is only, I say it only to emphasize the importance of the subject. I wish you a fruitful discussion. I apologize, I have to jump from one event to another event uh, during this uh, week, and, and, and therefore I will not stay here. Not personally, I would like to stay here more than in other events, but, but I am obeying my assistant, and she is going to send me to another event. So thank you very much, and I wish you a very good evening. So thank you very much, uh, Itzik, and a pleasure uh, you can be opening it. So there's actually another nuance to the title. So as you can see, well, not exactly the title, we're here at the Hall of Justice. 
what is the hall of justice for those geeks in the audience it's actually exactly it's the it's the headquarters of the justice league aquaman superman batman wonder woman and so on but we are the guardians of the cyber galaxy so this is marvel so you don't mind that um, my name is uh, Nip David. Uh, I am a cyber director for Ericsson North America uh, and Ericsson Israel as well. I am also a fellow and lecturer here at Tel Aviv University with the Blavatnik Cyber Research Center for quite a few years already, I think 12 years or even more. Previously, I was head of aviation and space cyber programs for the Israel uh, uh, Aerospace Industries, one of the Israel and I think the world leading defense contractors, especially in air and space. Um, and still very much involved in the space domain. Um, I'm beyond excited to moderate the coming session and the panel afterward. Uh, before I put her, uh, Mr. Kobe Menashe, I'd like to um, highlight an exciting event to do next year here in Israel, and I think it's just another example of Israel's leadership in space and security. So the Israel Space Agency, uh, together with IAF, the IAF is the International Astronautical Federation, uh, will host the global conference on space, on secure space, also known as GLOSS, G-L-O-S-S, uh, here in Israel in the spring of 2024, uh, which is really a great thing. Um, and GLOSS 2024 will address various topics of interest uh, in relation to a secure space with a specific focus on space traffic management, debris, uh, mitigation and remedy, uh, sorry, space debris avoidance, mitigation and remediation, cybersecurity of space assets, norms and standards, and so on and so forth. Please, everybody, consider this as a personal invite on behalf of the Israel Space Agency uh, and the uh, head uh, of the Space Agency, Brigadier General uh, uh, Reserve, who could not be here, and uh, so I'm speaking on their behalf. I would like to present the next speaker and my friend, partner, partner in crime, uh, and colleague uh, uh, making this session and uh, panel uh, actually taking place here and now. So, Mr. Kobe Menashe, Kobe is the manager of Guidance Department and Spectrum Defense. There's actually something like that in Israel, which is outstanding. Um, in the Defense Division with the Israel National Cyber Directorate. Those of you who were at the plenary, main plenary before heard Mr. Gabi Fortner, head of the National Cyber Directorate, who had an amazing, tricky presentation. I was shocked, and you know, like, I would, we should have brought him here. Uh, um, Kobe is responsible on behalf of the INCD to deliver methodologies, guidance, and professional support in cyber spectrum defense to critical infrastructure and cyber units at the government offices and for the guidance of the Israel Mapping Center since 2019. Um, in his previous role, Kobe served 30 years at the Israeli military uh, INOD, INOD, C4I, as the head of SATCOM brand. Kobe? It's a very rich uh, session. Uh, only 15 minutes to talk about uh, satellite, cyber, and in between, and of course, uh, some uh, recommendations for the next. So I will try to, to succeed. So, uh, what we're going to talk about? First of all, I will try to just to clarify and talk about the SATCO, uh, SATCOM uh, architecture. Uh, what are the basic uh, applications? Do more zooming about the uh, cyber threat to the space segment, the link segment, and the ground segment. And I, of course, uh, finish with uh, how we can reduce the risk. So basically, I believe that uh, most of the audience here are SATCOM, uh, but just to clarify it, right now the example is uh, talking about the uh, satellite communication that uh, located in the air stationary orbit. In the height of uh, 36,000 uh, kilometers above the equator, which is the optimal point to, to be directly and uh, connected all the time with the same position uh, on Earth. Uh, so we have the space segment, this is the spacecraft. We have the links segment, which uh, connect between the, the spacecraft to the user segment, teleport, and the SEC, the satellite control center. So I will try to, to elaborate all the details about each uh, segment, but uh, as Professor uh, Benison mentioned, 
satellite is a band type, but is a, you see the type of the application, almost everything. We do the sat satellite that today, satellite is more accessible uh, than uh, before. Uh, you can see it in the academic, in schools, uh, the industry are more dominant than the, the government. So there is a lot of uh, application. I come from the army, and I have the honor to, to establish the SATCOM uh, facility that based on the teleports, uh, terminals, and of course, uh, and of course the, the satellite. And uh, it was very exciting, uh, very important uh, mission. So let's move forward to the cyber threat to the space signal. First of all. When we talk about the SATCOM, we have a, a few parameters or a few components of the satellite itself. First of all, we have the, the payload. The payload, this is the, the main mission. It could be a camera or communication relay. But this is one of the targets that uh, the attacker or the adversary uh, would like to, to attack. Uh, by, uh, the, the adversary can do denial of service, can uh, cause damage by... Uh, Put some malicious in the supply chain because uh, the satellite is, satellite is including so many uh, components and uh, so many company and it's it's very difficult to, to verify that uh, every piece on the chain is uh, fully protected and of course we have the hijacking. So this is basically the main threat. Um, I can tell you that. Uh, there is another threat that related to kinetic and uh, some uh, satellite that uh, RPO satellite that they could, can uh, actually physically touch the satellite and cause damage. And uh, but basically, these are the the main uh, main threats. When I talk about the, the threat to the link segment link and the downlink, the uplink is the the communication from the ground to the satellite, this is more sensitive cat, and we have the downing. Uh, most, the, most of the attacker are separated between the uplink and the downing. Professor uh, Benzer mentioned the crime or one of the attack was uh, to jam the, um, the communication satellite that uh, supply uh, internet and uh, other communication to the crane, so the jamming was in the uplink. In the uplink, actually, you, this is the most uh, terrible uh, uh, attack because when you when you know what is the uplink frequency and you use it and you jam it, can cause damage to the, all the user that uh, supposed to get uh, services from the satellite. In the downlink, actually, when you are jamming chain, um, so to actually jamming only specific area. For example, in the, one of the Gaza Strip uh, events, the Hamas used one of the free uh, uh, satellite and uh, actually succeeded to transmit so 40 second movie that was uh, received by all the customer that uh, use this free Services actually, this is a fifteen thousand, uh, fifteen thousand uh, family. Basically, this is the Bedouins, you know, the guys that they like to uh, to use it. It's not relevant for yes or the other uh, commercial uh, So, uh, in the space segment, we have the option to jam. And I'm talking about the spoofing. Just imagine that uh, you are watching. Uh, for example, channel TV, channel, uh, sport channel, and you expect to see some, something that related to, to the sport, and then you see different uh, message or something that, that this is type of the spoofing. So actually you know how to, to put the exactly uh, message uh, during the, basically it's doing in the, in the downloading. And of course, we have the different uh, type of attack. I won't, don't want to elaborate more than that, but the most uh, types of the attack that we see is it's basically jamming. Uh, 
let's talk about more examples. Uh, so it's like that you can see uh, some small picture about the uh, Russian plan to understand it to this type of law. Actually, you know, so I'm going to focus on uh, this law because there is a lot of activity uh, in cyber and space. In the beginning of the world, uh, we're going to install some uh, GPS or GNSS interference. It's happened uh, almost every time. Uh, we have some uh, space event, and in the last uh, months we saw uh, a lot of uh, activity that's supposed to uh, cause jamming or spoofing to the uh, drones that uh, work for the Russians or, or their plans. Uh, one of the famous ones is uh, the Starlink, uh, just to, to to remind to the, the people here that uh, Elon Musk, uh, w w when the, the war started, Elon Musk shifted part of the his satellites in order to connect Ukraine to, to the internet, and the Russia tried to attack, and the uh, uh, Russian tried with the jamming and then spoofing, and the guys uh, of uh, Starlink, I'm talking about the, the IT systems, do some... Uh, uh, changing it the software uh, version and there's actually was the cyber and the uh, space uh, war and it was a thing and uh, very interesting and actually it's happened all the time it's not most of the events are famous but uh, if you are connected to the specific person or specific uh, website uh, there is a lot of information I can uh, tell you that uh, we are in INCD we published some recommendations uh, the insight that we have in the Ukraine and the Russia war. It's uh, basically uh, regarding the protecting from uh, GPS jamming uh, or spoofing, and of course, uh, how you can protect uh, your uh, SATCOM communication. Uh, you can see uh, one of the attacks was the uplink jam. You can see it in the spectrum. Maybe it's not uh, not obvious, but uh, the Russia um, transmit very high uh, power, and they block one of the DBT uh, channel or the ES channel, and they actually they block all the services. The company that owns the satellite may use the geolocation. They they create the channel very close to Moscow. Let's talk about the uh, GNSS. First of course, the next session is supposed to be more elaborated about uh, GNSS, and uh, there is uh, some professional that they're going to lecture, and uh, of course, they will include uh, some uh, person that actually uh, impact from the G GPS jamming. But just in a uh, nutshell, when we were talking about the GNSS Global Navigation Satellite System, we're talking about uh, four. Uh, type of system. We have the GPS, this is the American, the GLONASS, Russia, Baidu, the Chinese, and the Galileo European. Each one of them uh, supply uh, services. Position, time, and everything. So, like the SATCOM, you can uh, see that the uh, GPS is uh, using everywhere. And of course, uh, in the next slide, I will uh, focus on the specific industry that the uh, impact on the GPS uh, Jamming, um, actually, my duty in ICD is to take care of the critical infrastructure regarding, of course, the, the, the ports and the banks and the, a lot of uh, agriculture, of course, communication, and all of them are uh, some effect uh, from a GPS uh, jamming or spoofing. So, the problem, uh, it's, especially in Israel, it's a uh, it's, Everywhere, especially very close to the border. Later on, I'm going to see, show you some map that I uh, uh, will describe where is the, the specific places in Israel that uh, suffer from uh, interference. But actually, the jamming is very cheap, and it's very easy to to buy. And uh, they're using the the fact that uh, the signal that we are seeing from the satellite is very very weak. It's very easy to jam, and of course today with the SDR system, it's very uh, easy to, to spoof. There is a few sample of uh, few examples. 
The uh, Iranians are very strong in cyber and spectrum, especially in space, uh, and between them, and uh, more than 10 years uh, ago, they show their capability in order, in order to, to land in their facility a very sophisticated uh, American UAVs. And unfortunately, today, we see that uh, the reverse engineering that they made is used in the Iranian Russia world. GPS jam a free website that uh, reflect all the jamming around the, in the world and especially uh, Israel in the last uh, uh, days. Uh, later on, uh, Peter from Aeron will show in live what, what is the interference map that reflected from the Iridium satellite. So I skip uh, and uh, move to the next slide. Here there is a, a GPS interference in Israel, the heat map. It's a showing, showing everyone here what happened in the air, land, and sea. And, uh, most of the industry that uh, suffered from the, from the GPS interference in Israel is aviation and uh, agriculture supposed to elaborate it later on. Uh, to the ground segment, uh, maybe this is the, the most uh, vulnerable one because if, the, if I I'm trying to be the, the adversary, I will try to, to attack the SEC and the teleport. So one of the uh, famous uh, example was the, the attacking of uh, Viasat uh, teleport. Uh, very big one. <laughs> Uh, very secure, but uh, fortunately it was not secure enough. Uh, the I believe the Russia attack used uh, uh, unsecure VPL uh, connectivity and caused damage to 9,000 uh, 9, modems uh, that uh, needed to replace damage to the Ukrainians and of course uh, different facility around the Ukraines. Okay, this is the last one. So I think that uh, the space this is not different from other industry. But the impact in the, by attacking a space, a satellite, uh, it's, it's a huge. But uh, the main concerning is first about the awareness. <coughs> Fortunately, i familiar with the, the industry in Israel, and uh, the awareness of the cyber risk to the industry is not clear enough. Of course, uh, we need to strongest the, the collaboration between the government, the manufacturer, and the operator. This is one of the things that I'm trying to push. Of course, the supply chain is one, one of the major cyber attacks. It's not relevant just for space, it's relevant for the, most of the sectors. And of course, cyber by design. It's almost uh, impossible to, to fix things uh, after you launch the satellite and oops, you understand that you have, a, you have a problem. So the cyber must be part of the initial uh, uh, design. and. Uh, this is actually the, basically the, the small tips that I can continue be given uh, this. Uh, thank you very much. And enjoy for the next. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kobe. Uh, I'll just throw the next one. So, um, we are, oops, sorry. We are very, very honored to host here today uh, Mr. Sam Wisner, uh, a technical fellow at the Aerospace Corporation um, and the Vice Chair Board of Directors for the Space ISAAC, the S. ISAAC. Uh, ISAAC is in the and IC Center. Sam served previously as a MITRE Tech Fellow and the Director of the National Cybersecurity Federally Funded Research and Development Center, MITRE, sponsored by the National Institute of Science and Technology. Sam was appointed in 2020 as a member of the Board of Directors of the Oak Ridge Associated Universities and served as the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of the Space Information Sharing and Analysis Center, the Space Isaac, which I've mentioned. Sam is an adjunct professor of science and technology in international affairs at Georgetown University, where he teaches a course on cybersecurity policy, operations, and technology. Sam was also a member of the Intelligence Community Studies, Studies Board of the National Academy of Sciences. Sam served previously as a member of the Army Science Board and in industry. Sam served as a general manager 
manager of several cybersecurity businesses. He also served as a senior executive at the United States Department of Defense, and he even whispered to me that he spent a few years in Israel, and he actually enjoyed it quite a lot, right? Uh, Sam, the stage is yours. So I'm from Washington. We're here to help. <laughs> And being from Washington, of course, as you may know, we have passed a, a federal law in the United States that requires me to use PowerPoint. Um, and I will use PowerPoint, and I have far too many slides, and I'm going to go fast. And if anybody wants copies of these slides, first, you should go and check in with your psychiatrist. But if, you, <laughs> if your psychiatrist feels that you still need these slides, email me, and I will send them, I will send them to you and then you can read them, and if you need something to fall asleep at night, this will absolutely work. Um, I want you to talk briefly about two things. First, the Space Information Sharing and Analysis Center, which is a very, re which is a very real operational attempt to improve the cybersecurity of our country and, the, the, and, and of allies and partners, their space systems, particularly given the growth of the sector. And I'm going to end by a, a few brief comments about why I think this is important. Um, but I want you to keep in mind a couple of terms. The first term is collective defense. We are in this together. We, there are no borders in cyberspace. There are no borders in space. We are not in a position to do this one country at a time, one country alone, which is one of the reasons I'm honored to be here today uh, back in Israel. The other is a term that you may have heard this morning during the plenary when somebody said this is about influence, that what's happening in cyberspace is not just about taking or exploiting information or attacking information systems, but it's about gaining global influence. And I think your security director made that point more eloquently than I possibly could. Hopefully I this work. Um, we are an operational organization. We are not attempting, by the way, to be the security operations center for a space company, but we are trying to coordinate information and act to collate and to, um, we're acting to, to, uh, take this information and try to relate this information, what we see about cyber threats, as well as physical threats, as well as geopolitical threats. In essence, we correlate this information and give it back to our members. Our members are principally commercial companies, mostly in the United States, but now some overseas, and hopefully Israeli companies will consider to join. And we have affiliations with national governments. We certainly have affiliations with the U.S. government, and I'll show that to you. We built now an affiliation, a memorandum of agreement with JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency. We're negotiating similar agreements with Kness in France, with the U.K. Uh, space Agency, with the European Space, a with the European space Program, and others. We are therefore trying to be the principal communication channel for correlated information that is useful to the space industry. I don't have to spend a lot of time on this slide. You know that space is big, right? People talk about it reaching a trillion dollars by 2030. I think we'll reach it by 2027 or 2028. There's talk about it reaching $1.4 trillion of economic value by the end of the decade. There are more missions than there used to it's not just communications, it's GNSS, it's uh, support to critical infrastructure, it, it's manufacturing, space travel, space colonization, space mining, uh, and certainly, as you can see, uh, remote observation. And certainly, if, if, you can, if you're following the situation in Ukraine, where the Russians thought they were going to be sneaking their big armored units around and nobody would see them, not so much. Didn't work that well. As you know, the market has also expanded. And then the number of Elon Musk intends to have in his initial constellation some 12,000 satellites. Tall people in the audience you should duck um, because they're going to be whizzing overhead and with as many as 40,000. Uh, those of us who study this field believe that national and economic security are essentially part of the same thing and that a threat to economic security, to critical manufacturing, to critical infrastructure is a threat the national security. The public sector is making increasing use of commercial systems, and of course, commercial use has been uh, commercial systems are being used by the public sector. In the United States, we know that all of our critical infrastructure sectors and all of what we call our national critical functions depend on space. You cannot in Washington D.C., and I expect this is true in Tel Aviv for those of you who are working in the space field. 
understand that space is now important to absolutely everything. And you can just take a look at any trade magazine or look at the Washington Post, I suppose you can see, see this in my read as well, that there are stories about space all the time. And what Maxar and, and Planet have done, what Starlink and others have done in Ukraine, in essence, has been to provide them with a space-based capability that their adversary did not really expect would be uh, as effective as it's been. And this is something that's vital to all of our countries. We all see this. I was going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but thank you. You did that for me already. Uh, but if people will say, you know, what depends on space? I've looked, we've done a number at the Space ISAC and working with our friends at the Department of Homeland Security. We built a lot of use cases. This is just one. And I like this one because it's people who don't think about space systems, you don't say, well, why do I need space to grow food? Well, you need it to communicate with the farmer. You need it for GNSS, not, not just to move the truck to your local supermarket, to the local, what is it here, Supersol, but to move your combine around the field to exactly the square centimeter that you need to, to cultivate. You need, as well, IoT to be able to take a look at soil conditions, and you need remote sensing, remote observation to be able to look at, at where things are on the farm and what the conditions are. So for communication, for remote sensing, for navigation, space systems are there is talk in the United States, I haven't seen the data, that if our space systems went down, we'd lose one-fifth of our food supply overnight. Which, given my case, wouldn't be such a bad idea. Right? <laughs> my doctor says. Um, you don't need me to spend a lot of time on this. This is how we tend to look at the space. At these, uh, we've broken it down into launch, comms, space vehicles, engineering, payload. We have cybersecurity companies who've joined the ISAC and cloud and data processing, and, and other companies are joining. We're up to about 70 members. We're hoping to be at 120 to 130 by the end of this year. We share information on threats, vulnerabilities, and incidents, and we work with and share information as well with a large part of the federal government, and as you know, we're now building our international, uh, our, our global presence. We have a lot of task forces. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We're working with the U.S. Department of Defense to improve cybersecurity of companies that are involved in the space systems through the cybersecurity maturity management uh, management model. Our exercise task force is conducting real exercises uh, about four times a year. We just did one in Paris. If you're going to do a tabletop exercise, Paris is a great place to do it, particularly in April, a hardship. <laughs> and, but somehow I managed to survive it. Uh, and we simulated an attack on ground station as a service. And we looked at two notional companies, one that did have zero trust architecture and one that did not for them. Um, we are holding our space summit in, uh, in October in Colorado Springs. If you've never been to Colorado Springs, I recommend it. It's being held at, at a campus somewhat like this at the University of uh, Art Center. Uh, and as you may know, in the United States, there is a policy, special Space Policy Directive 5, which is designed to put out the principles for the cybersecurity of space system. We are working to help the Office of the National Cyber Director, you met today, Kemba Walden, um, on the implementation that needs to be done. Um, we have a lot of other working group. We're, we're working on supply chain risk management. That's important. And we now have a new group that's working on system lunar operations. As we go back to the moon, as we put an orbital infrastructure around the moon, as we begin to think about putting bases on the moon and having humans stay there permanently, I have a number of candidates I'd like to send. Um, I even, but I, I won't, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about them later. Um, uh, that group is now up and running and it's being, uh, it's being run by a very, very, very talented young woman, Dr. Gabrielle Hedrick from Germany. So you can see that the range which we're involved is enormous. Uh, we're working on blockchain. We're very concerned that there is an inadequate workforce development. I'm certainly an example of that. And we're trying as well to take a look at the use of AI, both how AI can be used to defend the cyber systems on which space depends and how AI may be used by an adversary to find vulnerabilities and to exploit those vulnerabilities in near real time. It's no longer zero day, it's maybe zero minute or zero second, and that's why AI is such a problem for us. 
Our watch center got opened. Uh, we'd hoped to do it last year because of, of the pandemic. We had supply chain problems. But we couldn't get our furniture. We had all the technology, but we needed things like big screen displays and actual desks and chairs. So it took a little longer. It is, in fact, up and running. Um, and it is a correlation center. We look at cyber and physical data. We get cyber threat information from the environment. We get it from uh, Microsoft and we get it from other commercial sources. But we also look at things like anomalous behavior in satellite orbits. And we correlate this to be able to warn our members that we think something may be happening and what it might be. If you come out to uh, Colorado Springs, you're welcome to see our, our center. I was there as we got it established in March of this year, which was really an exciting thing. It's something I hoped I would see in my lifetime, and we did. Um, you already got a sense of um, uh, that, that, uh, that presentation just a few minutes ago. Uh, we are using these under our understanding of the threats at my segment to build, watch, to build use cases that are informing our analysts in the watch center. There is a watch center, and it's got the usual number of young people looking at big screens. Um, these are really bright young people. Um, I don't think any of them are even half my age. And we are um, uh, increasing the amount of, of data feeds that we're getting to really do a multi-domain awareness kind of an operation. Um, I will let you, uh, if you want these slides, we can send them to you, but it tries to give you a sense of the tooling and we're also using synapse, uh, synapse essentially to do the threat correlation. So I don't need to spend a lot of time on that. These are some of our current priorities that we're looking at. And as you'll see, they're not very different from the kinds of problems that you've already been exposed to. We're looking at, at, at threats from, from to SATCOM, from electromagnetic impulses uh, and interfer uh, interference. We're looking at changes to satellite maneuvers. We've already seen evidence that that can be done. Nation, threat, nation state actors are a real problem. We've seen that and you've had that conversation here. And these are the companies that are working in our op center on these use cases. This gives you another sense of what our information architecture looks like. And you can see that there's a broad scope of information that's being correlated and being sent back out to our analysts, to our, to our members. There are a number of developments in the United States of which you may be aware. We have not yet declared that space systems are a critical infrastructure sector. We have said that all of the other 16 critical infrastructure sectors depend on space. So this debate is happening right now. Why has this not happened? Well, there are those who say, aren't, aren't all space systems part of comms? The comms sector has this covered, except for GNSS, except for manufacturing, except for space travel, except for the entirely unique infrastructure and industry around space. So there is a bill introduced by Congressman Yu and Congressman Calvert that would make this declaration. Uh, Congress has already told the Department of Homeland Security to put in place a cyber security, a satellite uh, space cyber information clearinghouse, which we expect or hope will be the, the Space ISAC Watch Center. Will this be considered a critical infrastructure sector? I hope so. Um, will certain space assets be considered systemic critical infrastructure? I think so. Um, what will be the sector risk management agency? Will it be the FAA? Will it be NASA? Will it be the Department of Homeland Security? And I think that's the question that people are, are playing with right now. That's all going to happen. I'm going to conclude this by talking about one other thing. And this isn't entirely about space. It's more about cybersecurity and why it connects to space. For those of you who grew up in the business, People think of cybersecurity as essentially securing or exploiting information. And we think about it as information. Our adversaries, and frankly, I think yours, don't look at it that way. They are not interested in safeguarding information. They are interested in manipulating cyberspace in such a way so that they can influence outcomes. For them, the only information part about cybersecurity is safeguarding the state from information that they think threatens the sovereignty of the state. Your privacy, anyone else's privacy, is an incidental concern. So as we move in the old world of cybersecurity being about defense and exploitation and attack, today it's more about an attempt to control. And as space systems become more vital to cyberspace, 
understanding the security of those space systems and the role that they may play in building this new global cyberspace is important. So let me put it this way. Uh, rather than spend a lot of time on this, and you can see those slides anytime you want, I want to go directly to the point I'm trying to make here and why the cybersecurity of space systems is important in ways we hadn't considered. People have asked, is cyberspace a domain? That's, I think, I don't want to say a, a naive question, but in a sense, it really is a question. We have almost 8 billion people in this world. We have about 5 billion of them who are already in cyberspace. And they don't just connect through cyberspace. It's not just electromagnetic. More and more of us are resident in cyberspace. And our critical infrastructures don't just depend on cyberspace. They are increasingly resident in cyberspace. So there are more people in cyberspace than there are anywhere else except on land itself, right? And just to give you a sense of where China views cyberspace and why it's so important, in the United States and in Israel, our exposure to cyberspace was relatively slow, right? We developed that things like SAGE in the 1950s for air defense in the United States and built TCP IP, and then we had the ARPANET at DARPANET. We began to move in the direction of cyberspace happening, but it was slow. China sort of discovered cyberspace around 1998. By 2009, they had 100 million people in cyberspace. By 2012, they had more people in cyberspace than we have people in the United States. So for China, which now has this chart's outdated, and I apologize for that, there's over a, a billion people in China who are online. Over a billion people in China who are online. And if one has looked at China's policies and Russia's policies, they do not define cybersecurity. I'm just going to see if I have it here. If I have the right one, which I may not. There it is. They do not define cybersecurity as the protection of information. This is from the Shanghai Cooperation Accord, signed by those two great paradigms, paragons of democracy, China and Russia. It is not about the protection of information. It's about protection against the distribution of information harmful to political, social, and economic systems. Cybersecurity is about securing the sovereign prerogatives of the government. It is not about the protection of the information. Where is China going with this? I'm going to ask how many of you have heard of One Belt, One Road? Right? and the thing that's going along it, the Digital Silk Road. This is the largest global development initiative in history. We'll see how well it goes. This is from The Economist. Again, I don't think it's very detailed, and I think it's a little out of date. But this is an attempt by China to essentially um, get their other country, they're financing it, but they, the collateral is other countries' natural resources, which is causing some pushback. But it is, in essence, to put in smart cities and roads and communications infrastructures and ports and everything else a country needs to modernize. And what goes along that is China's view of an information infrastructure. You're not going to be able to read this, but this is on the web from Alibaba, China's essentially combination of Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. Maybe the only company left in China soon, right? Although they did, I think, kick Jack Ma out. What you have on the left are all of the devices that are feeding information into the city's brain, into the AI. You can see the applications below. Unfortunately, it's not really legible. The convergence, the machine learning, which habituates the data, and the artificial intelligence, which makes decisions about the data, is in the middle. And the infrastructure to the right, the power infrastructure, the road infrastructure, the water infrastructure, when to change the light from green to red, when to add a car to this underground, to the, to the, uh, to the metro, um, how much water pressure to put in that part of the city, where to send police resources based on reports of crime or people going through red lights. That's all controlled by the, inf that's all controlled by the ML and AI in the middle. That's how that works. Who runs this city? The mayor? The city council? It look, doesn't look like it to me. As this model gets implanted along this one belt, one road, 
And as China starts to build out the information infrastructure, including a global space information infrastructure, this allows China to take its digital authoritarian model and to give it to other countries. Or even worse, those other countries might ask China to run it for them. And so the cybersecurity of space systems is not just about protecting the integrity of our systems, which is a hard enough problem, but it is also part of the struggle for essentially global control and global dominance, one in which I think China has a very distinct vision. That's a lot to absorb. I hope I am on time. And with that, I'll take it. What? Perfect. And with that, thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, Sam, for this awesome presentation and, and discussion. Uh, let me oops, and show. And let me just uh, put the next one. All right. Um, before inviting our next speaker, uh, Mr. Steve Epstein from Rafael, I just want to reflect on one thing that uh, you said, Sam. Uh, and that's actually about, you know, definitions. And uh, you, you mentioned that it's important, you know, that we speak the same language and, you know, cooperation and so on. And you mentioned space IoT. The only issue is that for space engineers, IoT is actually in-orbit testing. Um, really, check it out on Wikipedia. Uh, I can see many of my students here, and thank you guys for coming. I'm very proud to have you here. So we actually went through it uh, in class. Uh, so, you know, talk to a cyber, cyber engineer or a cyber expert or a cyber professional, talk to space engineers, talk to them about IoT, something completely different. And the language barrier and the jargon barrier, it can be in English or in Hebrew or any other language, um, it's really a must to, to overcome if we want to work together. Mr. Steve Epstein, um, a cybersecurity architect from Rafael Advanced Defense Systems, also uh, sponsoring this uh, session, not out of pocket, out of your pocket, I hope, um, but uh, thank you very much, Rafael, for, for that. Uh, Steve is currently working as a senior cybersecurity architect for Rafael Advanced Defense Systems. For those of you who know, out of Israel, one of the world's leaders uh, in um, defense, uh, leading defense contractors, everybody heard about Iron Dome. Um, it's partly theirs, uh, also I, I. Um, focusing on security of space systems and other critical infrastructure. Previously, Steve worked as a fellow distinguished engineer and vice president for companies such as Cinemedia, Cisco, and NDS. Steve has vast expertise in, technologic, in technologies such as cybersecurity, big data, machine learning, cloud computing, 5G, watermarking, broadcasting, and the internet. Throughout his career, Steve has filed over 40 patents and has spoken at numerous conferences worldwide on a wide range of topics. So I don't know if you can file another patent, but you can add another conference right now. Steve, please. Uh, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. The honor of going third means I get to repeat a lot of what was said before by Kobe Menashe and Sam Wisner. I'm happy that it's going to be consistent, so at least I know the information is correct. Rafael in space. Rafael, as, as uh, Nir mentioned, is a defense contractor. On the other hand, it also has been involved with space for over 30 years. Rafael makes propulsion systems, it makes antennas, it makes all the other accessories, um, which enable to put satellites and keep satellites in space. They've, they've worked on over 100 satellites. In 2019, they were, they were awarded uh, the Advanced Constellation. In addition, Rafael as we mentioned, the Iron Dome makes a lot of military systems and systems of systems, and as part of regulation, as part of those systems, to make the strongest military-grade cyber defense to ensure the adversary doesn't infiltrate those systems, and therefore it's only natural that Rafael, which does cyber on one hand and space on the other hand, is involved with the strongest cyber defense for space systems. This was mentioned many times. I'm going to reframe it a little bit. What is the criticality of several satellites? Dr. Ben Israel mentioned this, Kobe mentioned this, Sia mentioned this, but I think you could divide it to two. On one is communication to remote areas where there is no infrastructure, namely no ADSL and no cable. Uh, we could talk about two-way communication to planes, to maritime vessels, to remote military units, or wireless gas drilling sites, to critical infrastructure like wind turbines, um, and that's usually typically using two-way VSAT systems. 
which is the user segment or the payload data, or one-way broadcasts of television data around the globe, used typically on the geostationary orbit. In addition, as also mentioned, satellite is a means of collecting data. It could be intelligence, it could be GPS or GSS information, it could be meteorological information, so essential or intelligence gathering. So essentially, satellites are, at least according to this critical infrastructure, whether they're defined um, in, according to all standards, um, as Sam said, that remains to be seen, but satellites are critical for our day-to-day -day lives. I could not even drive around the block without GPS today, and therefore without a satellite I will be doomed. So what is the motion of the adversary for hacking a satellite? So I think we can def define it as three essential motivations. On one hand, in the, the ideal situation, uh, the adversary, which is typically is a nation state with tremendous amount of resources, could actually sabotage or damage a satellite. Actually, in 2008, the Chinese almost hijacked the Terra AM1 satellite, um, which would have been the only reason they didn't was because they didn't know the protocol to control the satellite, but they were actually communicating directly with an American satellite, which they could have taken over. On the second hand, they would want to disable this timely mission critical information or data reception, um, preventing um, the, the, the people of their, you know, the other country from receiving this data or being able to communicate, where even a momentary loss could be critical. And finally, they would like to eavesdrop or access the confidential data or potentially spoof the data, again, which is just another disabling attack. So on one hand, the consequences of hacking a satellite are catastrophic and the motivation is real to the point that Dmitry Rogozin of a typical was a uh, Russian uh, space chief he basically said that hacking our satellites is a justification of war and yet in 2022 and again Kobe mentioned some of these cases we saw lots of news articles about the threat of attacking satellites as Kobe mentioned, space, Elon Musk and SpaceX totally beefed up his Starlink terminals against both jamming attacks and cyber attacks because he was threatened by Ukraine, uh, by Russia attacking satellites as well as other U.S. space leaders warned all different satellite operators that they better beef up their cyber defenses because of the threat of Russia against those satellites. Hackers claim that they were able to attack or penetrate the Roskimos ground station of the Russians basically taking hold of the seizing control of some of the Russian spy satellites. Russia claimed that wasn't true, but again, that was another potential attack and maybe even a successful attack that happened in 2022 against space. As Kobe mentioned as well, uh, the acid rain wiper by Russia against the VSAT terminals in Chinese, where they essentially penetrated the VPN and they were able to issue malware that deleted the boot, boot sector on February 24th of over 9,000 VSAT terminals, also was a very successful attack, which then caused tremendous communication outages throughout Ukraine, loss of internet, and loss of communication with all the wind turbines, causing many damage to the wind turbines in the field. So even though Dr. Ben Israel says we haven't seen it, Till 2022, that was a correct statement. This is changing dramatically, and as we'll see very soon, that the mythical air gap is never an air gap. We're going to see more and more malware will get into satellite systems, and more and more of the services that the world depends on space for will be hacked and will be lost. And therefore, it is critical to provide the strongest military-grade defense for our satellite systems in order to keep those services in place. So what are the cyber threats to the satellite systems? And again, this was discussed before, and I think we could divide it into three different areas. On one hand, we have the ground station, which again, Kobe discussed, and here we're talking about supply chain attacks, we're talking about rogue operators, which could be the insider threats, it could be anyone stealing the credential of an operator, it could be anyone breaking into a VPN of an operator, or malware from a connected systems. Any of these threats can then cause faulty control commands to the satellite, thereby disabling or even sabotaging the satellite. At the user segment where we're talking about two-way VSAT communication, so you also have supply chain attacks at the VSAT hub and VSAT terminals. 
You have malware from the internet to the VSAT hub if you don't have a proper firewall or DMZ. You have the VSAT control center where, the, again, a rogue operator or stolen credentials can easily configure many VSAT terminals to the same frequency and therefore essentially create a jamming attack and disabling all those VSAT terminals or a software upgrade could be a software upgrade um, could then in, in, in inject malware into the VSAT terminal as well, and some people actually state that the uh, acid rain wiper was based on a software upgrade. So the consequences are catastrophic, the motivations are real, the threat landscape <laughs> is immense, and we've seen many threats happen, so how do we defend our space? And this is where Rafael comes in, where we believe very similar approach to the military grade cyber defense that's needed for military systems is also the same military grade cyber defense which is needed for satellite systems and anything less will be penetrated and hacked. Oh, finally, okay, just go back one. The satellite itself, which I didn't discuss, is also threatened because you have your denial of service and hijacking replay attacks, as well as spoofed it from a rogue ground station, a spoof data may come from a rogue satellite, and an eavesdropper with the keys, or if the information is not encrypted, which in many cases it's not, can easily receive that critical intelligence data. So now we're getting into solutions. So Rafael essentially believes that you need multiple layers of defense. And the first is network protection. Network protection has different elements to it. On one hand, at a layer four, you'll need a very strong firewall. At layer seven, you need intrusion detection to ensure that anywhere, any way known attacks are kept out of the space, kept out of the satellite, kept out of the ground station, kept out of the VSAT terminals. In addition, and this is which is, is unique, which is why I believe that the solution Kobe is slightly different than cyber in general, is that when it comes to network protection, we need to whitelist our APIs. If the ground station speaks to a third party, we should specifically whitelist those commands with those ranges of that known API. We shouldn't bring general API of cyber defense, thinking that it can protect every API, but we need to whitelist and customize our protection for that specific space communication. And therefore, only that way will we minimize the attack surface. And finally, as we've seen, especially with ChatGPT and all the ease of creating malware today, you can blacklist the known prob blacklist the known attacks, you can whitelist the known protocols, but you still need to protect against the unknown. And you can have malware masquerading as a valid system, and therefore you need AI-based anomaly detection on top of the blacklisting and the whitelisting, and this must be done in tamper-proof hardware. Because the second the hardware is not tamper-proof, then your network protection will be hacked and the filtering will be changed, and then this protection will essentially be made completely irrelevant. When it comes to endpoint protection based on zero trust, you never, you never just trust the perimeter, but you must also protect the endpoint itself. Same idea. Exploit protection to, to, to block the malware kill chain and protect any known exploits to memory. Whitelisting to ensure that you essentially harden the operating system to only allow the specific needs of that application. It only can receive the files of the application now uh, needs. The DLLs can only be DLLs that you know the application requires, as well as the system calls need to be whitelisted in order to only allow system calls of the operating system for that application, plus you need to whitelist only those specific applications. And then on top of that, you need anomaly detection against the unknown, and you must do secure boot, secure download, integrity test at the, at the station to ensure that the software is not modified. In addition to network protection and endpoint protection, we have secure communication. Keys should never be in the application itself. Keys must be placed on separate tamper-proof, anti-tamper, FIPS 143 Level 3 compliant hardware to ensure that the keys are inaccessible. If you have the strongest secure communication between the ground station and the satellite, or between the VSAT hub 
and the VSAT terminals. Essentially, those keys will be out of reach of any hacker, and therefore no hacker will be able to eavesdrop on the satellite since there's no way he'll ever be to the signal, nor will he be able to hijack the signal since he'll never be able to authenticate himself against the satellite, nor will he be able to ever intercept the VSAT communication. So secure communication, all the keys, and all the cryptography must be removed from the application and placed in tamper-proof secure hardware. And finally, you need a secure operation center which communicate, which speaks to both the network protection and the endpoint protection and the secure communication in order to enable the operator to understand what attacks are going on and receive alerts and provide instant response. So Rafael solution to satellite system will look as follows. In terms of sending telemetry control data from the ground station to the satellite and receiving telemetry back, there may not be secure communication between the ground station and the satellite. Again, removing all keys and cryptography from any application and separate in special tamper-proof hardware. Every application must have endpoint protection to ensure no malware ever, be it runtime or file-based or fileless malware, ever gets into one of the critical systems without being detected and prevented and exploited. Um, as well as whitelisting those applications to ensure that the operating system only allows expected application-specific system calls and, 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 and DLLs of files, and there must be network prote protection based on that specific application's ICD between the third party and the ground station, as well as the ground station and the ground terminal. VSAT, very similar way of securing VSAT, again, using military-grade application-specific security, secure communication from the VSAT terminal to the VSAT hub, tamper-proof hardware, network protection from the VSAT control to the VSAT hub, as well as from a download server to the VSAT um, terminal, um, as well as endpoint protection in the satellite, in the VSAT hub, and in the VSAT terminal. So in short, Rafael Cybersecurity for Satellite is based on the following military-grade design principles. One, it's mostly preventative. If you find a hack in the satellite, it is way too late. You've got to prevent those attacks. To, to detect that the satellite's been hijacked is not very helpful. We need multiple layers of security. Security of the endpoint, security of the network, security, secure communication. Based on zero trust principles, you can't trust that any other layer of security is sufficient. You need to blacklist the bad, whitelist the good, and support on the known, and support anomaly detection on the unknown. I mean, on one hand, kill the block the, the malware kill chain, block the malware kill chain. On the other hand, minimize your attack surface. And even if a zero-day virus gets through, anomaly detection will be able to detect it and stop that attack. And again, all this needs to be application specific. There's not that many applications in the ground station and the satellite. We know what they are. We can customize our security around those specific applications. Number four, incorporate military grade cryptography with very large keys and secure hardware and deploy the military grade cryptography along, along with key management in tamper-proof FIPS compliant hardware. Once we've done that, we will accomplish our goals of one hand, maximal satellite end-to-end -end security, protect against zero-day attacks, comply with this security framework, follow the methodology of zero trust, implement defense in depth, and answer to the NIST-2 directive where space is part of the NIST-2 directive, and only then can we sleep at night knowing that our remote satellite communication and our critical satellite data will not be interfered with with a very powerful nation states such as China and Russia, which has all the resources in the world and all the motivation to hack into our satellite systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. That was incredible. And uh, I think something, uh, well, you know, I, I, unfortunately I don't have shares in Rafael, or I think only the state has, 
Um, but something very interesting is happening in the Israeli space domain. I think Rafael is actually leading that, and that's a change from uh, the Israeli aerospace industry is leading, leading the uh, space domain. So, uh, first of all, Rafael is the most uh, secretive defense contractor in Israel. So, Steve was never here, you never heard what was said, and all that. But seriously speaking, even if you look today on some commercial catalogs of space components, such as the SAT search and so on, uh, one of the known ones, um, you will actually find Rafael components listed there, you know, commercial components, everybody can buy them, I don't know what, if you have something to do with them, but uh, if you are in the space industry, uh, you have a lot to do with them. And that's a mind-boggling change, it's, it's really a paradigm change, like from being very secretive to becoming open, to becoming commercial, at least on that side. Uh, and that's amazing, Steve, and I really hope that you carry on with that and maybe even see like cyber components listed on SAT search um, and so on. So thank you very much to all the speakers. It is now time for our panel, um, which I hope and know will be as interesting, and I'd like to call um, uh, one of uh, the participants one by one. So, uh, Maya, your first, uh, Mrs. Maya Grican Corriente. <laughs> Maya is uh, sometimes known in Israel as a space goddess or the, mothers, uh, the mother of satellites or dragon satellites, I don't know. Um, but she's actually a mother of two real humans. She has a BSc, holds a BSc in aerospace engineering and a master's in systems engineering from the Technion Institute in Israel in Haifa. Uh, she has been working in the space industry since 2000. Um, she started with the Mabat Space uh, Space Division with the IAI, um, and she's currently the CEO of Space Shellist. Uh, it's the first Israeli privately owned company, as well as the head of space operations for Sky and Space Company SAS. Um, Maya is a certified SDK, Satellite Toolkit Expert, specializing in astrodynamics and mission anal analysis, and is considered one of the leading experts in that field of Israel. I can vouch for that. Um, Maya is also a senior communications satellite engineer, experienced with satellite operations, actually one of the first operators of the AMOS satellites, the Israeli communication satellites. Um, personal, uh, uh, personnel training, operation, operators and satellite engineers, operational procedures, writing the SCC, Satellite Control Center optimization, and so on. On. So, Maya, nice to have you with us. Um, Mr. Moshe Noah, Moshe, you're there. Moshe uh, Noah is the SVP of engineering at uh, Ramon Space, a leading provider of space resilient computing infrastructure. With over two decades of leadership experience in engineering R&D, Moshe has a proven track record in creating cutting edge products in the wireless telecommunications and space industries. Prior to joining Ramon Space, he served as the VP of Engineering and General Manager at Skylo Technologies, where he built a successful team and sp spearheaded the development of satellite IoT solutions. That's Sam's IoT, not my IoT. Um, Moshe has also held significant technical leadership roles at industry powerhouses such as Qualcomm, Velocity, which was acquired by Qualcomm, and Intel. He began his career in the elite 8200 cyber unit of the Israel Defense Forces. He holds a bachelor degree in electrical engineering from Ben Gurion University, that's in Beersheba in the Negev. Where did Maya go? Oh, you're hiding her, she's so small. Uh, okay. And then I'd like to call my uh, uh, friend, uh, Advocate Danor Hoff, uh, 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 who actually made it on time even due to Tel Aviv traffic. Um, Dan is a New York and Israeli attorney and an acknowledged international leader in the field of data protection and cyber laws. Dan founded the Orhoff Law Firm in 2013 with a vision to create an environment of excellence with a personal touch to innovators. Uh, on a personal note, uh, I'm one of the cyber professionals. I think I actually like very much what you said, Sam. That I think that privacy is the enemy of security, but even though Dan and I are very good friends. Um, his expertise in, is derived both from academic and practical experience with extensive knowledge of the technology and innovation industry. Uh, he also formed the Strand Advisory International Privacy and Cybersecurity Consulting Firm, and he currently serves as the firm's CEO. He has done so many other things that would take us about uh, two hours, seriously, but uh, specifically for space, Dan is the legal counsel of Space IL and works with a lot of new space startups, space projects development here in Israel manage and, and, and globally, management and space invader, investors, so welcome, Dan. 
And uh, the last uh, that I want to call before USAM uh, is uh, my friend Omri Wexler here from the University from the Yuval Neyman Workshop and the IC, well, that's the ICRC uh, uh, Cyber Research Center. Omri is a cyber threat intelligence analyst uh, with Cognite, a researcher at the Blavatnik Interdisciplinary Cyber Research Center, a senior researcher at the Yuval, Yuval Neyman Workshop for Science, Technology, and Security, uh, and a lecturer on various cybersecurity related topics. And I believe late, le uh, actually yesterday night you gave a cyberspace talk in a bar. Yes. Yes. So uh, next time we just do everything in the bar. It's a complete waste of time doing it here. Um, exactly. Much okay. better experience, I'd say. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, okay. His research fields include many, many things. National cyber strategies, ransomware, counter ransomware strategies, influence operations and cyber threats on elections, cyber threats on space systems, and the role of AI in cybersecurity. He worked as a research intern at the Institute of National Security Studies in the Arms Control Research Program and dealt with nuclear arms arms control, the Iranian nuclear program, and so on. Uh, so welcome, Omri. And last but not least, you already know Sam. I won't repeat his resume. Um, and you already know me. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Hey, Derek. Uh, all right. So, Maya, actually starting with you um, as an expert both on the satellite space platform system engineering, uh, constellation management, and space operations. Based on what we just heard from the distinguished uh, uh, presenters, where do you see the main security gaps? Uh, is it in the engineering segment, the platform, ground or in orbit, or the operational domain? So, basically, well, the speakers talked a bit about it. Uh, but traditionally, it would be from the ground segment. So the ground segment was much easier to hack into. Um, but today, because of the uh, advancements, technological advancements that we see uh, in space, in, in the satellites uh, uh, manufacturing, in, in the design, then there are a lot, of, a lot more uh, hackable points. Um, for instance, using Linux on satellites, that makes the satellites uh, easier to uh, access the code. Uh, so today, uh, satellites actually have an operating system, which wasn't the case uh, 10 years ago, even, um, you know, a few years ago. It's something that is pretty new. Um, then you'd have, uh, if you're using Linux, so you have software engineers that like to recycle, not only paper, uh, they like to recycle code, and they use open software. So if you have open source codes in on the satellites, you can actually have a backdoor. Um, and that's not good. <laughs> um, so usually you didn't have that. You had the, it was different uh, architecture, different software. Um, today you actually have a mini uh, network in the satellite because it's Linux. So you actually have several computers talking to each other instead of one computer who rules them all like in, in the past. So you actually have uh, the access points to each of the computers on the satellites instead of just one computer and then you'd have to know, like uh, Steve said, I think, you'd have to know the protocols of how to control the satellite. Um, and last thing is using uh, TCP, for instance, using standard internet protocols uh, like Starlink. So now you have basically an access point on ground from every single terminal uh, to the satellite and you can actually do um, some kind of, uh, let's say, maybe a, a malware or to upload things like uh, the speakers have talked about and to hack to the satellites themselves instead of just the ground segment. So if previously it was the ground segment that was easier, you'd say, to, to hack into, even though it's not that easy, but satellites have become more vulnerable. So I think, th thank you, Maya. That's a very interesting perspective. And again, a paradigm change from the past that I think not all industry is fully aware of yet uh, globally. Uh, Moshe, same uh, or similar question to you. Uh, and I would like to also emphasize since Ramon Space actually designs and builds uh, industry leading space certified systems. So, what does Ramon, how, how does Ramon understand this challenge? How do Ramon's systems embed cyber solutions such 
as encryption, advanced algorithms, and so on, uh, as you actually need to integrate and comply to the toughest regulations that are customer requirements. NIST or not NIST, your customers are the top level, uh, commercial and governmental. And the second question is how is actually Ramon, related one, how is Ramon evolving its products to be not only radiation uh, uh, resilience, uh, as you originally started, but also cyber secure by design and so on? Thank you, Neil, for the starting here. I will just add on top of my, so I'm coming and presenting the commercial side. So as you're probably all aware, space become much more accessible. It's much easier to get uh, access to space, uh, um, which means much more uh, uh, use cases, start and use space. If back then you need to have a very strong uh, use case uh, 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 to spend hundreds of millions, it's become much easier. The major trends of uh, uh, the, the ability to send the CubeSat uh, 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 actually open a bunch of use cases, which means actually enable more and more capabilities, enable more and more commercial application to be uh, in use, which means, again, much more data generated in space, uh, uh, much more data which is not necessarily defense and I would say strategic, but much more uh, 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 commercial which bring the on Earth and space to be very close. Uh, uh, and what we see that there are a lot of modern techniques that act actually on cyber specific, which are developed and deployed on Earth, become relevant on Earth. And we do see that our customers actually coming and asking us as the company that built computer for space, computer for missions, to deploy uh, uh, on Earth uh, security techniques, security uh, aspects on our uh, uh, products. And to answer your question, uh, yes, Ramon was uh, in a very unique situation. Uh, Ramon was building chips for uh, for space and did some uh, some uh, a shift into building system. Ramon is uh, doing revolution around building computer for space and en enabling all of those commercial uh, uh, use cases I mentioned before. And as part of that, we are leveraging all the knowledge we build, but we are building now uh, a system. I think someone before mentioned that we are designing security by design. We are taking that into the, the architecture. And I will touch a point that Maya uh, 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 mentioned before. Space become much more software oriented. I mean, a lot of software, a lot of com uh, computers, uh, which mean again, software defined, even software defined. Yep. And this is exactly many of the layers that, that typically r was running on ground now running on uh, on the space itself. Just one example on the cellular cellular fully adopted space. The next generation uh, 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 space will be part of the cellular, which means part of the base station center will be on space. Uh, and this is just emphasized how the, the, the cyber security and the cyber modern techniques will be applicable and be implemented in space. So, so I think, Moshe, thank you very much for, for that reply. And, and I think, uh, you know, referring to what Maya said, so you're actually the next step in evolution, uh, in the space evolution, not in the dragons. Um, but uh, b because again, the, the, the space platforms are becoming more vulnerable, even though, you know, we all look at the ground, we look at IT uh, and so on. And uh, very rightfully said, this con this is actually my, my business of NTN, -end, the non-terrestrial networks. So all this convergence uh, with 3GPP cellular and space and SATCOM and so on. So uh, I'm actually happy to hear that that uh, we're not going to get hacked all the time. Thank you, Moshe. Um, Omri, moving uh, to you. So uh, in recent years, we see a dramatic increase in space war discussions. Uh, I'm not sure if in space war examples that uh, is for you to uh, teach us, uh, but in space war discussions and emerging technologies and threats very focused on space war, cyber and non-cyber, uh, a highly intensified uh, domain. Uh, so, what can you tell us from a research and analysis perspective that you do? Uh, how has the threat landscape changed? What is going on up there and down here? Um, uh, is it real or is it just uh, on a statement level and, and so on? So, uh, thank you, Niv. I think that in order to provide the audience with a more um, accurate picture, we need to make a, a clear distinction between two trends. Um, that are basically are being defined and, and treated uh, um, interchangeably. And these are, uh, the research community at least differentiates between the uh, militarization of space 
and the weaponization of space. Now, the militarization of space basically focuses on um, utilizing space services for military purposes. And we've seen uh, many, there are many, of course, you know, space almost started as a military um, sector, basically. We can see it with reconnaissance uh, uh, satellites, uh, remote sensing, uh, satcom, military satcoms, and so on. And actually, we know that the governments and militaries used to build their own uh, satellites and own infrastructure, but a funny trend here is, or an interesting one, I'd say, is uh, that the war in Ukraine actually redemonstrated to us uh, the the use of commercial uh, space services for military purposes. I mean, look at Maxar technologies, look at Starlink. Um, and so this trend is 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 here. Um, the other trend, the weaponization of space, uh, concentrates on basically developing anti-satellite capabilities or mounting weapons on satellites or orbital platforms. And in that sense, it's it's a trend that has been ongoing gradually from the 1950s, but it was ongoing in a fluctuating uh, manner. We've seen some years with a decrease in activity, we've seen some years with an increase of activity. And so in recent years we see this sharp increase that is defined first of all by more and more states that have been establishing um, specialized military space commands and forces. Uh, Sam um, mentioned the US uh, Space Force, but also Russia, China, Iran, Australia, France. Um, this is just a partial uh, list out of just the five to seven uh, last years. And in another way, we've seen uh, an increase in the, in the testing of direct ascent, uh, ASAT, uh, kinetic weapons. Um, an interest, a very interesting case study is India in March uh, uh, 2019 which was very surprising because India is not known to be a country that have pursued an aggressive foreign or defense policy, uh, neither not in space. Um, Russia in 2020, 2021, and also a lot of reports about these um, dual, uh, uh, dual use technologies, orbital dual use technologies such as as Kobe mentioned uh, earlier, um, RPO, rendezvous and proximity operations, all these satellites that can uh, really s almost stick to other satellites and are used uh, for repair or maintenance or, or, or uh, debris removal, but in a, in a way they could be also used to ram or collide with other satellites or tear off parts of satellites. So we've seen a lot of these in, in last years. And so basically, yeah, these are not statements. Uh, it's an ongoing trend. Okay, that's uh, actually a bit concerning because, again, we are speaking here mostly about cyber, but if I understand well, you correctly, there are many physical and kinetic attacks as well. And, and definitely much more electronic warfare examples and cyber capabilities uh, um, examples, such as uh, we've talked about Viasat yeah. and Starlink, so yes. Okay, so moving on to you, Sam, and actually you gave a great description and, and I think uh, not only a description, also an analysis of what is going on and what, uh, uh, what we're expected to see. But really, like, if you look at the Russia-Ukraine war, so the Russia-Ukraine war made space war a reality. So it's not that we haven't seen, you know, examples before, but this happened. And this happened also on some commercial equipment, aka Starlink, Viasat, you can argue uh, how commercial it is or not. But this is a change. And of course, everybody here who is a space geek um, follows, you know, the news. And like now, actually, the American DOD is financing Starlink for Ukraine, uh, for military, and, and that uh, Starlink was never meant for that uh, in the beginning. Um, so, and of course we learned a lot from it, but from a security perspective, uh, and again, you touched upon it, Sam, but I, if you could emphasize it just a bit. Okay, what have we learned from a security? What should we secure? And it's beyond the ground, so it's the modems, the uh, malware, and, and so on. Where, where would you put your budget and resources where, if you need to? Well, um, apart from my in-laws, where <laughs> there's always a demand for budget, right? Yeah. They um, are Russian? No. <laughs> uh, not that I can tell. Um, a couple of things I would say. First, um, it is really true. The Russians have made clear that any commercial satellite system that is being used to support their adversary, in this case Ukraine, they regard that as a legitimate target. 
um, which means that norms associated with attack against space systems are not necessarily going to hold. And up till now, mostly they have. That's that's so. One issue is is we need to be reinforcing norms, and we need to raise the price and impose consequences for norms violations. That's not a technological issue, but it is an issue. One technological component of that, however, is attribution, um, which I think we can do. We do need to be able to attribute this. Cyber problems have always had attribution challenges. I think we are beginning to overcome some of those challenges. Yes. Um, a couple of things I think ought to be done. If you're familiar with the recent um, exploits of Move, Move It, and of course of, of SolarWinds, we need to take a good look at the software supply chain. And I've argued that the software supply chain for satellite systems is like any other software supply chain. It needs to be better secured. Um, there is some talk about applying what's called a software bill of materials, also known as an SBOM. Um, generally, in the in the in the cybersecurity domain, I think there is somewhat of an emergency to do that um, in in terms of of the uh, in terms of software for space systems. By the way, there's a U.S. presidential executive order on supply chain, but it does not refer to space. Uh, no, it, 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 and one of the other issues for one of the other reasons for declaring space systems a critical infrastructure sector is that it would begin to extend these other requirements. Um, one thing that has happened, by the way, is the National Institute of Standards and Technology has begun to extend the cybersecurity framework uh, and this cybersecurity framework to space systems. Yes. And I think Steve even referred to that. In his, and by the way, I was quite surprised, like, you know, Raphael acknowledging something by NIST. This is really an amazing change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a couple of other things that I would say, however. Um, although you, you, you wanted to go beyond ground stations, the, the, ground, the ground segment, I think that requires as much emphasis as possible. One thing we are seeing is ground station as a service. You can buy ground station as a service from Amazon. Um, I'm not going to take out my phone and order one, but I suppose I could. Yeah. And that means to me that ground station as a service is becoming increasingly commoditized. And commoditized industries are notoriously difficult to secure. So finding both a technological and frankly perhaps a policy and need, dare I say, a regulatory approach to improving the security of ground station as a service, I think, is, is, is vitally important. Next, I think physical attacks against space systems. I'm, I'm sorry to say, but I agree with you. I think that, <laughs> that physical attacks against space systems, including satellites that essentially can sneak up and ram and do other damage, is an increasingly real, is an increasingly real threat. Um, and if we can't perfectly characterize every adversary system in orbit, then we don't know exactly what they what they can do. Um, and that, I think, means that we need to redouble our efforts in the science and technology information that we have about our adversaries, as well as understanding their 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 intention to use those capabilities. That's rather a thank lot, but that's a story. No, no. Th th thank you very much for that. And this actually is a great segue uh, for Dan. Um, and Dan, reflecting on what you've just heard fr from Sam and from the others, and these very, very blurry lines between the national, the commercial, the governmental, the military, and so on. So a couple of questions all combined. So, A, what can you tell us about the legal and liability aspects of all that? So if I buy ground station as a service from Amazon, and by the way, also Azure Space and Spectrum are providing that now. Do I have the liability? Does the cloud provider has the liability? Not cloud, or the ground. Uh, and that's, by the way, a question being asked, and I know you're uh, one of the experts on that, on, on, on cloud laws and privacy and so on. Who has the liability? The customer, the, the infrastructure, the, I don't know, the government, and so on. And how do international and national in selected countries, space and cyber laws, and of course regulations, come into play concerning cyber attacks on space platforms, if at all? Uh, and I'll stop here and I'll ask the next, that, that question later. Yeah, thanks, Nate. Uh, these are I'm multiple your, I'm questions. I'm testing your memory. Uh, I forgot all about them already. Well, I'm happy that, uh, you know, to play the role of the enemy as a privacy practitioner as well. As a lawyer. And of course, as a lawyer, yeah. you um, asked me questions about how can you sue people. Uh, that's quite obvious. So um, I'll just to make try to make some sense out of it. And, and there's, of course, a lot to talk about liability in terms of uh, uh, space-related and cyber-related uh, uh, issues. Uh, so just a, a glimpse of it on international local levels. 
Um, so, so essentially, just a, a, a brief overview for those who are not very acquainted with, with the space law. Space law, so to speak, uh, started in 1967 when uh, the Soviet Union, the United States, and the UK has led an international treaty called, uh, in short, the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, and, and that treaty, one of its articles, Article 7, talk, talked about liability. Uh, and it didn't talk about liability uh, related to specific um, commercial companies, uh, for example, but more around the liability of nations, of countries. And essentially, in plain language, it provided that um, a country that a launch occurred from the territory of the country would be liable to damage caused by that launch or by the payload of that launch. Of course, it has some, it has some, some conditions and some, some uh, provisions around it, and it was further uh, enhanced uh, four, year, four years later in, in a specific um, convention about, about liability. But that's the gist of it. And that's, um, and, and that's of course, uh, interesting because back in 1967, nobody thought about cyber type of damage. Uh, they thought about, uh, I don't know, a satellite falling on someone's head or uh, um, a rocket exploding or something of the sort. But uh, that's the beauty of laws. Uh, they talked about damage and they didn't define it. So essentially we can, you know, uh, enhance the concept of damage to damage caused, for example, from cyber security attacks as well. Um, and, and the business damage doesn't give like a personal harm or physical, a business exactly. damage losing money. Yeah. So, so essentially, and that's interesting. And that's just an interesting notion because uh, you know it's uh, it's it's extremely difficult to uh, to sue the attackers of us. Uh, but, but essentially, when it comes to space, so there at least in potential certain use cases, you can think of the country that launched, for example, that satellite mounted with cyber offensive capabilities, you can sue that country for liability for the damage caused by that certain satellite. So that's a sort of a good luck idea. suing a Russia. And exactly. Yeah. And and that's and that's the and, and that's a, a sort of sort of a, the uh, shortcomings because um, well first of all the the uh, those um, treaties talked about damage caused by space ob objects, not to space objects. So if for example there is a deliberate cyber attack on a specific satellite or a constellation, that would probably not be covered under these international laws. Uh, the second aspect, for example, is that not all countries ratified uh, these, uh, um, these uh, the, the treaties. Uh, the um, Outer Space Treaty was uh, ratified only by 112, about half of the countries uh, in the world. Israel is one of them. Uh, so international law so to speak. No, not count on international law, that's what you Don't count of it. Okay. I mean, it's, uh, it's probably uh, full of uh, uh, loopholes around, uh, around damage associated with, with our topic here. Now, going to the local laws, so uh, essentially when probably most local laws would talk about damage in terms of either tort law or criminal law, and most local law would tend to look at where the damage was caused, where it happened. So it doesn't really matter if it was caused by uh, something on Earth or by or through using a satellite, for example. Uh, so um, if um, hackers use satellite uh, uh, to impact uh, some targets on Earth, uh, that would probably apply local laws. That would. Uh, however, uh, if the attack again, if it, it if if it is aimed at a satellite itself or it's a, a space-borne uh, object. That is beyond territorial reach, and, and therefore there could be a gap in local laws in enforcing sort of again these types of attack on uh, uh, you know objects in, in in orbit. So that's I assume that that's maybe one one good aspect of the idea that, that that yeah essentially laws do not cover all potential use cases associated with damage caused as a result of cybersecurity attacks. And there is also the aspects of uh, what type of legal or statutory requirements do you require from a company yeah. in order to defend itself and its customers, for example. And that's, again, I can elaborate it later on if you like, but that's, again, that's something that is not entirely covered under law and there are a lot of loopholes associated with it. Yeah. And, and I know, Dan, that you've been actually uh, working with many of the recent uh, 
really cool space operations like growing hummus in space. It's actually not the hummus that was served uh, at the main plenary, but a very similar one uh, and, and so on. And I know that despite this loop, I mean legal loopholes or, or gaps in international law, local law and space law, but business laws do apply. And I know you've been drafting very strict contracts for these companies, you know, to protect themselves, to protect their customers and so on. So I'll always have the lawyer at your side, even when doing space business. Yeah, I think there's, that's the, there's no vacuum with their, when there are lawyers around. Okay. We have to, at least two in, in the audience. Um, Ma'am and gentlemen, um, I'm almost tempted to tell the audience to go and have their break and we can continue into the night uh, because it's, uh, you know, having this panel here. But unfortunately, uh, just as uh, Professor Ben Israel said, we all obey to one person who is Rotem uh, here. Um, and uh, we need to take a break. Uh, so we'll take a 15 minutes, 15 minutes break and continue with the next panel. I have so many, so, uh, so many more questions, but we'll do that some other times. Thank you so much, Omri, Maya, Moshe, Sam, and Dan. And thank you everyone for listening. I see that the uh, serious uh, person is uh, staying here, so it's good. So I would like to start the second session that uh, focusing on the uh, position, navigation, and timing risk and mitigation. So as uh, you all know that uh, GPS interference has become a real problem in the recent years in the global uh, arena in general and uh, in the state of Israel in particular. The disruption affects many areas in the civil uh, arena like agriculture, ports, aviation, emergency, emergency services and more. The next session will be focused on the type of the disruption and what we can do uh, to protect against them. I would like to present our first uh, speaker, Mr. Omer Shaw. Omer is a co-founder and the CEO of Infindom with extensive knowledge and experience in the GNSS uh, industry. Omer co-founder Infinidom in uh, 2060. The company specializes in developing GPS uh, protecting and navigation resiliency solution specially designed to defend drones and the anchor against jamming attack. Omer holds a bachelor's degree in uh, mathematics and computer science from uh, Ben Gurion University. He also earned uh, an MBA in international business from IDC Herzliya, uh, especially uh, through the GMBA, Global MBA program. Please welcome Omer. Hi everybody, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, as uh, Toby mentioned, I'm Omer, I'm CEO and co-founder of Infinidome. And uh, what we do is we develop uh, GPS protection and resilient navigation solutions. Basically to, you know, we all look at uh, GPS and protecting GPS as a means to an end. The end at the end of the day is to execute our mission and actually not drop from the sky when we're talking about specifically UAVs. Um, so what I will talk today is uh, about data that we collected on uh, GPS uh, interferences and uh, attacks that we have collected from Israel and from uh, a little bit from around the world. But before that, I want to reiterate a little bit about what we were talking about in terms of GPS. So I'm looking at GPS as the most critical, invisible dependency we all rely on on everything. DHS categorizes 12 out of 15 sectors to be completely directly reliant on GPS. Take that away, that creates a huge financial damage to the economy. We're talking about four constellations, we talked about that, GPS, GLONASS, Galileo and Beidou. The problem is that all of them are using almost exactly the same frequencies, L1, L2 and L5. Very constant frequencies that if you know them, all you have to do to actually jam them or create a beautiful denial of service attack is to transmit something, anything really, in that same frequency range. 
Now, the problem with GPS, and GPS, don't get me wrong, it's an unbelievable technological achievement and implementation of Einstein's theory of relativity. But its inherent problem, its weakness, is how weak the signal is. Now, the signal received by our phones, by drones, by vehicles, are about as weak as if you take a 20-watt light bulb, light it up in Berlin, and try to receive its signal. It's light here in Tel Aviv. That's about how weak GPS is. Well, well below the floor noise, or the noise floor, sorry. Now, that means that all you have to do to overpower it is to transmit something which is very easy to do. This is a GPS jammer. You can buy these things on AliExpress, as we mentioned before, for about 30 bucks. When I click this little button over here, I create a wonderful denial of service attack of anything around me about 100 meters away. I can amplify that signal by adding stuff that I can buy on Amazon today and making this thing effective from half a kilometer away. Doesn't matter what you're trying to receive over there, L1, L2, encrypted signals, it doesn't matter. Jammer is a jammer is a jammer. So, on the left here, we already looked at this. This is gpsjam.org. This is ADSB uh, information collected from um, airplanes, commercial air, air, airplanes. What you can see over here is Israel and Turkey and the area of Ukraine. This is the first two weeks of interferences in June, so not a long time ago. What you can see over here is that high-powered interferences are affecting not only the war zones, but everything around them. Look at what happens between Israel and Cyprus. So the problem is getting worse, and Ukraine just accelerated that. On the right, there is a very interesting task force that was assembled by the EU, deploying 40 antennas across Europe, and they detected, on average, a few hundred attacks per day that they realize of GPS jamming. This is in Western Europe, France, Italy, UK. So the problem is bad and it's getting worse on a daily basis. This is a really cool, sorry for the noise. This is a really cool uh, road show that happened in Shanghai about a year and a half ago. What you can see over here, our drones started to drift away and collide with adjacent drones and start falling from the sky over boats and over sheep and over the Shanghai River. These are drones falling. The cool thing about this is that the drone operator that won the tender to won this show filed a lawsuit in Shanghai police about a year ago against a competing drone company that used a GPS jammer to cause this. So this is a great visualization of what happens when a UAV fully dependent on GPS or GNSS meets one of these guys. We talked about Ukraine. This is from Business Insider, an article about three weeks ago. Ukrainians are losing on average 10,000 UAVs per month, mainly to GPS jamming. Those are mainly multi-copters, you know, DJIs and the likes. This also includes fixed-wing UAVs and other bigger, scarier stuff. They all have the same problem and the same vulnerability, which is GPS jamming. Now, even to militaries and, and MODs that are not directly involved in the Ukraine conflict, like Israel, unfortunately, everybody understands that the next conflict will look like this. And everybody is trying to prepare for that. And that's why anti-jamming capability are going to become a standard on everything that is a defense. It's going to be very recommended to Homeland Security. And it's going to be mandatory even for commercial airspace when trying to do crazy things like beyond visual line of sight or autonomous navigation. Now, I want to explain a little bit why GPS or GNSS is so critical especially to UAVs over there. Multicopters don't only use GPS to get from point A to point B. They use, multi, uh, they use GPS also to actually stay in the air and stabilize. It's an amazing thing to look at what happens to a multicopter when it's blasted by a GPS jammer. It doesn't say give up and say, I'm going to land safely. No, it tries to stabilize itself. It catches a very sharp angle, drifts away in seconds, and either collides with something or just runs out of battery and crashes into the ground. That's the number one easiest way to take down a drone today. With fixed-wing UAVs, you're not going to take down the fixed-wing UAV, right? But what happens is that signal intelligence is crippled. 
you're not able to navigate, you're not able to map anymore, so mission is compromised. When talking about loitering munitions, right, fixed wing UAVs that don't come back. These things at the end, a half kilometer at the end, they use a camera and an INS, you don't need GPS. But the loitering part, 95% of their mission is based on GPS. Take that away, take away loitering munition capability. With manned vehicles, it's actually very interesting. We were taught that by the U.S. Army that we're starting to work with. U.S. Army has 230,000 Humvees. 40, 50,000 of those need GPS protection and don't have it today. Very, very few hundreds or maybe a few thousands have. But why do they need GPS protection that bad? Because they need to do something called blue force tracking or IFF, identification or friend or foe. You need to be able to manage your forces in the field. That today is being done by GPS. Take away GPS and $150,000 Humvee, take away the capability of managing that fleet. So after I scared you so much, let's talk about what can be done. So there are many alternatives and all of the Mafats and the DARPAs out there are pushing for alternatives. Vision Nav, LIDAR, INS, radars, all fantastic approaches. I'm saying don't trust any of them and don't trust me either. Use as many sensors as you can, fuse them, integrate them to create a, a, a system that's robust enough without a single point of failure. Because the problem with all of these wonderful sensors is that sometimes they don't work and most of the time they don't work well enough. In darkness, in fog, in rain, when flying too high, when flying too low, when flying over desert, when flying over green fields, they don't work well enough and that's when they come back to unprotected GPS. So, what do we do? I apologize again for the loud noise. Thank you. So uh, this is an illustration of basically what can be done and what we do. Basically what we're doing is we are receiving the GPS pattern in a very um, different way. When a big bad jammer comes in and blasts your GPS and ability to receive anything, what we're doing is actually using multiple antennas, combining their patterns and receiving in a very different way. We're creating what's called a null. That null basically allows us to attenuate or subdue the energy being received by the big bad jammer. Now, our first generation can protect from a single direction of attack. This is, by the way, a first generation product. And our second generation, GPS Dome 2, slightly bigger, can protect from up to three directions of attack, meaning that it can be able to protect from three attacks simultaneously and dual band protection as well. The idea is a little bit like going outside of your house in a very bright day. The sun is blinding you and you can't see anything, right? But if you take your hand and you hold your hand against the sun, you can see much better around you. That's more or less what we're doing. It's called null steering, basically. We did not invent it. We did invent how to do it on a very, very small form factor. And much cheaper than the rest of the giants out there. So our first generation GPS dome comes even in an OEM board that's 35 grams. That doesn't affect your payload at all. And even the price tag is fitting. This is most of where we're going with GPS Dome, a drone in a box, large class one solutions, class two solutions, UGVs, small loitering munitions. That's a sweet spot for GPS Dome. In most cases, that's good enough. GPS Dome 2 goes for the higher end product, but again, we're not competing with the wonderful solutions that IAI makes and the wonderful solutions that Elbit makes. They're all making fantastic anti-jamming solutions, but usually they're about the size of my head and weigh about as much. That's why it doesn't make any sense to retrofit them on a $50,000 drone. We make something very different. We call it proportional defense. We come to a knife fight with a very good knife, not with a bazooka. So what I have over here is something pretty cool. A lot of times we uh, receive the question, what am I supposed to see in the field in terms of jamming? What is the scenario that I have to protect against? So we tried to answer that question, and we drove around in, uh, on the border of Syria for a few days trying to catch jammers. Now what you can see on the top side is U-blocks. This is the most common receiver today used in most of the applications. And all of those bars are the SNRs, signal-to-noise ratio, of all of the satellites that we're receiving. On the top side, you have U-blocks with GPS dome protection. The bottom side, you have GPS dome, or you have, sorry, uh, your receiver without our protection. What you're going to see, because it runs by really quickly, so what you can see on this side is a car navigating. You're going to see the green spot moving. And on the left side, what you're going to see is something pretty cool. 
on this side, all of a sudden, unlike usual jamming, will not be overpowered and dropped to the floor. It will actually slightly rise, but you blocks will be able to reject it because it's not common jamming. It's something called smart jamming or stupid spoofing. Spoofing is tricking you into thinking you're receiving good GPS when you're not. Jamming is killing your GPS. This is a hybrid creature that the Russians today have and Syrians are, are using it on a daily basis. So what you can see over here, on the, on the, you can see all of these navigating, right? All of a sudden you're going to see here, everything turned to blue, meaning that it's unable to use it. Navigation stops because it loses fix. The top side, we're treating it like a jamming attack, although we don't provide protection per se for spoofing, but we're looking at high powered signals. This was a very high powered signal. So we treated it like a jamming attack. We attenuated, attenuated it good enough to allow us to continue on navigating. So when you're navigating and everything is fine, uh, you know, everything is great. When you meet a jammer inside, of course, depending on the power and how close you are, you're going to have a chunk of time and distance traveled without GPS, right? Hopefully you'll be able to make it at the other end. When you have an INS, which is the common solution today for, let's say, denied navigation, you start drifting aside. You continue on being able to navigate, but you start drifting. And that drift is accumulated as a function of time. And it's not accumulated linearly, it's accumulated exponentially. Which means that the longer you are, even if you're standing in place, the further you're going to be from where you were supposed to be. When adding anti-jamming to that, even if you're going to be taken down eventually, basically we get jammed later and unjammed quicker. So we narrow down the time and distance traveled without GPS, even when you have a really, really good INS. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what I'm trying to convince my customers. We're trying to combine our anti-jamming solutions with alternative capabilities and INS, optics, and what we're doing with Honeywell. Honeywell is an investor in our company and we created something called the Resilient Navigation Suite. It's a combination of an INS, of a radar that uses Doppler technology to be able to track how it's moving and where it's moving, and combined with our anti-jamming solution, we're creating a suite that actually allows you not only to navigate fully in challenged environments, but even when fully denied environments, this allows you to complete your mission. We're working today with IDF on this and a few international projects as well. This is uh, actually, it's a little bit complicated. This is actually an experiment that we did with Honeywell and Czech Republic. So on the left side, what you can see over here is an experiment with lower power jamming. The right side, you can see very high power jamming. Uh, the blue line over here that is all squiggly is a regular PIXOC receiver that is being jammed. And when the jammer is turned on, you can see it goes haywire in both of these scenarios. The yellow is only our GPS node protection. So for low power jamming, we were able to complete that mission very, very well. When cranking up the power of the jammer, you can see over here, that we lost our capability to navigate. But using INS, you can see that it starts to drift off later, but it still drifts off. But using the combination of radar as well, it allows you to fully navigate even when going right above the jammer itself. And that's the advantage of using few sensors and not creating a single point of failure. Last thing I want to talk about is a new concept that we're working on. It's, uh, we call it GP sensor or GPS integrity and attack monitoring solution. It's an IOT like sensor that can be deployed on UAVs, on vehicles, and even on critical infrastructure. And what it does is collect data and analyze it. It's a little bit like a spectrum analyzer in your pocket. The idea is to understand, collect data on where, when, and how GPS is being attacked and relay that back to our cloud-based solution, which we're working on. But right now, this year, we want to do a few proof-of-concept programs. One of those will be, of course, in Israel. We already have a few sensors deployed around Israel. We plan to start deploying more. The idea is to create something a little bit like a weather map, right? Of, at the very least, understanding where GPS is compromised so we don't fly right into the storm. At most, it also allows us to do a pretty good job of understanding where the GPS jammer is. That allows us also to maybe 
understand where an attack might take place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Omar. It's uh, fantastic to see the progress that uh, you and your company made in the last uh, four years when I just uh, first uh, met you. Fantastic. Great. Okay, so our next uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Uh, Peter uh, Kabuter. Uh, Peter is a good friend. Uh, Peter is an Aeron uh, Vice President and Customer Affairs leading Aaron's program to support existing customers and develop a new relationship with the air navigation services, uh, service providers. Uh, Peter joined Aaron with an extensive uh, background on, on over 17 years in managing and directing sales within the Asia Pacific region and beyond, with a strong knowledge base and awareness of key issues that affect the navigation, the, the aviation industry globally. Please welcome Peter. Just organize that. Ah, okay, it's starting. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> thanks for that intro. Um, so, we're going to take a slightly different angle to this, so I may be less of a space geek than many of the other speakers were referred to, but more of an aviation geek in that regard. Um, I want to quickly kind of introduce you broadly about the capabilities of Arion and how that is relevant for GNSS and GNSS performance and interference. I'll try to scare you a little bit less than the previous speaker, because I'm talking about commercial aviation in the sense that if an aircraft loses GPS or GNSS, luckily it doesn't fall down, right? It stays, it can still fly, but obviously you have operational challenges by not having accurate uh, GNSS available. So, I have something interesting to show you, but briefly first. The reason why Aerion as, as an organization was created is basically to be able to provide space-based ADS-B for aviation purposes. So, to give you an idea, before Aerion existed, 70% of the world, 70%, I'll let that sink in for a second, was unsurveilled in terms of airspace. So the previous technologies are, you put the sensor on the ground, whether it's primary, secondary radar, or ground-based ADSB. What we have done is kind of shifted that paradigm and said, okay, let's use an existing te technology, ADSB, and put it in space. So we have a, a, a partnership, I would even say that's probably more than a partnership with Iridium. So our payload, uh, our space-based ADSB payload is on every satellite of Iridium. So there are 66 operational satellites that are obviously orbiting that are providing full cover. So we have a full coverage from ground all the way up, commercial spaces like six, uh, flight level 660, uh, covering everything from remote areas, ocean, deserts, and so on. So that's really the reason why um, Arion was, was created. And I can tell you now that that 70% that was unsurveilled before have dra has drastically, let's say, become a lot, a lot smaller, has decreased quite a lot. Um, more or less roughly 50% of the world's airspace is now using Arion data on a day-to-day -day basis 24-7 to separate aircrafts. The reason why I'm telling you this in the context of GNSS is that our data was created exactly for the purpose that I just explained, which means that also our, all of our systems um, are basically certified at a very high level of quality, availability, quality of the, of the data, and precision of the data, because as I said, this is used by air traffic controllers that are looking at the screen, they see multiple targets on the screen, and that data, that position is being delivered by Arion uh, by means of space based DSB. That obviously means that every um, update position of the aircraft that we transmit to an air traffic controller needs to be extremely precise. Right? You cannot say, uh, maybe we'll send you a, a position update, let's see, every 20 seconds, every 30 seconds, we don't really know what the latency looks like. Of course, in, in the world that we operate, that is absolutely not acceptable. So I can tell you that on average, globally, we are uh, seeing a latency of about 500 milliseconds and an update. So we receive an update of every aircraft every two to three seconds. Right? In many places of the world, that's a lot quicker. In some places of the world, that's a little bit higher. 
but that's kind of the average. So that means that we can really um, guarantee both availability and accuracy of, of the data for those uh, air navigation service providers that are managing traffic. So that being said, to get to the point that, uh, that obviously is relevant for the discussion today, um, using that data to monitor GPS performance obviously gives you an underlying layer that is extremely precise. So what we are doing to monitor, monitor GNS, GNSS performance is actually kind of shifting it around a little bit and we're using the aircraft as sensors. So within the ADSB message, so every message that we receive from every aircraft, there are indicators around the quality of the, G, of the GNSS signal. So obviously every aircraft that is flying, on average, let's say uh, simultaneously, there's about 13,000 aircrafts at busy times during the day that are flying. We basically are treating those air aircrafts as a signal, uh, as a sensor, to be able to capture what is happening with regards to uh, GNSS and the quality that, uh, of the GPS signal that the aircraft is reporting. Okay. Uh, linked to that, we also, um, because of the design of our satellite, the Iridium satellite constellation in our payload, um, I would say in 95% of the time, every aircraft is seen by multiple satellites. Two, three satellites on average, I would say, which allows us to do what is called IPV, independent position validation of every aircraft 95% of the time. In other words, even if the aircraft is transmitting a certain position, whether it's an avionics issue or whether it's a malicious intent to jam or spoof the position of the aircraft, we have the ability to compare what actually the position is of the aircraft, compare that to the reported position of the GPS. Okay. So to, to kind of link it back to what the previous speaker was saying, it's not 100% coverage, right? Because our satellites are, the constellation is built that they basically, they orbit and they, so obviously the coverage around the equator is less, so that's typically only one satellite. But if you combine this with other capabilities, that, that gives you the, that mesh that gives you a much better uh, coverage. Okay. So what I want to show you here is actually live as we speak. Um, in this instance, I've selected, we've basically divided the world into uh, hectagons of 75 square miles. And I'm showing you the last 24 hours. I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. Where you see red dots, basically you are seeing that in the last 24 hours, there was an issue, I don't know if you can see them anymore, uh, there was an issue with uh, GPS quality. Right? So obviously, uh, it doesn't need a lot of explanation why that is happening in that area around Ukraine and Russia. Uh, but you could see, if you, if you look at this here, and this is an airspace that is familiar to you, and you can see that there's quite a lot of uh, challenges there as well. And there's other parts in Latin America, for example, around Panama, there's also uh, patterns that you can kind of establish to see what is happening with regards to GMSS. So this is step one. This is really looking at every piece of that airspace in the last 24 hours. You can even look at it at the last hour or even more. You can build reports to establish patterns to see what is happening there. Now, you can over, overlay this with actual air traffic. So every dot you see on the map is an aircraft that is flying now. So this is live data. And if you would zoom in, you would see a bit more precise that these are actual aircrafts flying. So this gives you a number of, of insights in this already this very basic uh, capability that, that I'm showing you today. Okay, is if there's an issue with GPS, is it a specific aircraft that has an issue? In other words, is it one aircraft with a bad transponder? To give you a simple example. Or do you see wider issues with the quality of GNSS dropping in a specific region? Right? So also there, I'll give you an example. I'll just put this on one This will give you insights with regards to, okay, which aircraft is this? So it gives you transponder, target ID, transponder code, uh, mode 3 a uh, and, and obviously some position uh, information. You can look at the quality of the position, um, position integrity uh, category. So in this case, uh, it's, it's four, and we usually we use a pick of seven. If it's below seven, then we kind of flag it as uh, not, not really usable. Um, what is also interesting to check is that you are, you are able to look at the seven day I just selected now history of what this aircraft has done. This will give you insights, not just nice to know where has this aircraft been, but also gives you insights to, okay, 
is this again one specific issue with a transponder or an aircraft that is showing behavior uh, with regards to GNSS that is not desirable or is this something that is kind of dragging and you see in multiple locations that there's an issue with, um, with that capability. Um, so this, this obviously then as I said looks at the specific uh, aircraft and the performance in this case of the last seven days. Uh, you can do this obviously across. Um, you can zoom in to specific pieces of airspace. So I'll do that as well. So this is giving you for that specific uh, piece of airspace similar values. So in this case, um, you can look at the amount of aircrafts that flew through, the amount of ADSB messages that were captured in, within that specific piece of airspace. And then obviously that goes into uh, a quality indicator with regards to uh, GPS. So this is obviously helpful for uh, an air traffic controller that needs to manage traffic because you need to know, am I, can I rely on the actual quality of GPS in my airspace or do I need to do procedural uh, control of aircrafts separating them more? It also gives them more insight into when they are able to expect that the GPS quality is going to come back. So this is a dynamic measurement. So you see the values go down, but you obviously also would see the values go, go back up again. Um, in combination to that, uh, we've been talking about some of this, those capabilities earlier as well. The weakness, if I can say, of using aircrafts as a sensor is obviously if you don't have aircrafts in a specific area, you know, capturing GPS quality, right? Because you're not, you don't have sensors available. What we are seeing is that if you want to do a, a more specific search to where sources of jamming and spoofing are coming from, typically it's a very time sensitive exercise, of course, right? So you have every benefit of making that search area smaller. So what we're seeing is a, is a potential combined capability where we can kind of point um, anyone that wants to do tipping and queuing to specifically look at the location of where a, a jammer or a spoofer might be to actually make that search area a lot smaller using the precise area on data to be able to, to do that. Okay, so that's then again next generation and that's a combination of, of sensors and, and capabilities. Okay, so I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but we have some more panel discussions so we can go a bit more into detail. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Rami Schneider from Gila Telecom for assisting in bringing Peter to hear this session. Our panel moderator is Miss Deborah Arzer Poirier. Vora, or as I call her, Deb, is the Chief Legal Officer and Vice, uh, Vice President of Regulation at Confidas Digital Republic, leading Israeli cybersecurity data protection and crisis management company. Her role involves providing high-level strategy advice on the legal planning and regulatory uh, compliance in areas such as the cyber uh, preparedness, data protection, and cyber incident response. Deb has extensive international experience, including her involvement as a member of the international group of experts that draft, in, uh, draft uh, the 2017 uh, Tallinn uh, 2.0, uh, 2.0, a uh, manual on the state activity in, in cyberspace. She has also served as a co-expert uh, for the manual uh, on international law uh, applicable uh, to military users uh, of outer space. It's called actually Miramos. The uh, Miramos project has uh, been a member of uh, the uh, editorial uh, board of the McGill and the Pedia of the International Space Law. Please welcome them. One moment. Just to quickly announce that we're running a little bit behind, so we should be done by 6.30, okay? Thank you, enjoy. Thank you, so I'm being reminded by, thank you for the beautiful introduction, and it's an honor to be here, especially given 
the level of our panelists. So I'm reminded of um, the St. Crispin's Day scene from Henry V. Shakespeare. So it's we few, we happy few, we band of brothers and sisters, as the case may be. So we're not about to do battle with the French, but um, thank you all. Uh, as small a band as we might be, um, the committed team for space, uh, space and cybersecurity discussion. So thanks for that. Um, a few things I didn't want to forget to say. I'm not going to give a speech, but um, a, there's no question that the speech that I wanted to, to introduce our panelists by. No question that the cybersecurity related questions that have been raised all throughout the session, session are one of the cutting edge, intriguing, and I would even say strategically challenging issues that we have in cybersecurity today, space or otherwise. Space assets are far away. Attributions are more complicated, and so the everyday cybersecurity challenges that we have, and we all are very familiar with them, are exacerbated in the space context. And I think it's really important. My position is it's really important to take those differences into account. We've had wonderful examples in the assessment so far of how people are working really, really hard to narrow the gaps. And that's really exciting to see. Just to be clear, my hat's off to you and your colleagues in the audience. Just to be really clear, cyber attacks in outer space are no less uh, legally permitted than they are terrestrial. And referring to our title, uh, we really are talking about the galaxy. Right? So there's no context. Again, this happens. Thank you. So um, we don't have a different regime, in my view, in any event, in terms of the, um, uh, the, the responses to vulnerabilities and cyber attacks. Same, same. And that's a whole different panel, but just to make that point really, really clear. So in order to deepen this already uh, really profound discussion, the upcoming panel can be characterized as a group of people, five of them, who will examine the issues that we've been talking about from different perspectives. And if you permit me, I have a kind of a, as everyone was speaking during the earlier hours, a kind of conceptualization of what we're looking at. We've talked a lot about critical infrastructure and where space assets are considered critical infrastructure, where they're not. I'd like to offer that what we're really looking at with GNSS is the critical infrastructure of the critical infrastructure, right? So none of our categorized, defined, legally, um, legally outlined critical infrastructures can exist and operate, as many have said, without this, sub this sort of substrate of critical infrastructure of the PNT and other assets that we get from the GNSS. So that's my sort of conceptual observation. Um, we're going to go in a little bit of a different format from the earlier panel. So I'm going to call the panelists uh, by name. Uh, they'll come up and uh, seated as they're introduced. And then they're each going to have a very strict five minutes to make their presentations. If we're lucky, we'll have a few minutes at the end for questions. So thank you very much for the intro. And let's start with our first panelist. And we've mixed up the order a little bit just to keep things interesting. So. Yossi Shapiro, Yossi, you can come on up, take your seat. He's the Deputy Director of Israel's National Emergency Management Authority, which is called NEMA for short. In his current role, Mr. Shapiro is responsible for defining Israel's functional continuity plans during emergency situations. I hope you hear a lot about that. Before you assuming this position, he served as the Director of NEMA's Strategic Infrastructure Division. And prior to, join, to joining the MOD, he had a distinguished military career at the IDF Infantry, retiring at the rank of there it is, Lieutenant Colonel. He's a graduate of the IDF Command and Staff School, and he holds a Bachelor of Degree in Middle Eastern Studies and Poli Sci, which is a really interesting mixture, and a Master's Degree from Public Administration from Bar Ilan. You have the first five minutes. Um, you know what? Let me call everybody else up, and then I'll introduce you one by one. So why doesn't everybody else come up on the panel? Take a seat. So you'll see won't be alone. And I'll introduce you one by one. So, Yossi, please begin. You have five minutes. Go for it. OK. The um, question is, as opposed to everyone who spoke up to now, uh, we're not uh, space geeks, cyber geeks, or uh, aviation geeks, OK? And since we don't deal with what's happening in uh, outer space at all, but we deal with functional continuity um, here on the ground, 
uh, NEMA is responsible in any kind of, uh, of emergency to deal with uh, functional continuities to make sure that in a sense the Israeli economy keeps on working. That means that we have electricity, we have transportation, people have food, we have uh, medical service or whatever. So that's in a sense uh, our core responsibility. And in a sense in, uh, in um, um, well, we, we deal always in, in, we deal in, the, in preparation more than anything else. And once uh, an uh, emergency situation begins, then we actually run the emergency situation and we take care of promising the, uh, the functional continuity. As part of our job, according to a government uh, decision, we also um, have the responsibility of defining uh, the strategic uh, infrastructure of the State of Israel. Besides defining it, we also prioritize the different uh, defense of that strategic uh, in, in infrastructure. We look at different aspects of its defense. We look at its uh, physical defense. Um, anyone who uh, knows Israeli infrastructure, uh, we'll be speaking about uh, cement walls around uh, different, uh, different kind of infrastructure. Uh, we look at its uh, active defense. That's uh, what we know how to uh, give with uh, the abilities of the Air Force. We look at cyber defense, and when it comes to cyber defense, we deal mostly with Israel's uh, National cyber, cyber Directorate that have a branch of critical infrastructure. And since our lists and their lists are the same, and uh, we deal also with, um, besides cyber defense, also preparation for earthquakes, different things around that. And we also look at the infrastructure's ability and its vulnerability to those different threats. One of the threats that we, uh, we defined and we studied together with uh, the National uh, Cyber Directorate is uh, the GPS uh, jamming threat. Uh, when it comes to infrastructure, um, besides location, we have a, a problem with timing. There's different uh, timing and frequencies that are very important to us. In a sense, in order to have electricity, uh, the electric company has to make sure we're standing on a certain, uh, certain uh, frequency. And if there's a disturbance of that frequency, we'll all be stuck without electricity. That's one of the things. Um, so around this threat, what we did is uh, we have a wide survey that was done together with the National um, Cyber uh, Directorate and together with uh, uh, different, uh, different branches in uh, the MOD in which we studied the different infrastructure. We're, speak we're talking about energy, transportation, communications. Anyone who really knows the history also knows that uh, in the past few years we've had different uh, interference in those uh, in those different uh, um, infrastructure. We had a problem uh, down south with communications that was mostly uh, due to uh, to different uh, activities that were done um, by the Egyptians. By the way, things that happened uh, in uh, in in our airports, uh, which disturbed the uh, uh, aviation, had to do with. Uh, with disturbances that came, I think, from Russians and the Golan Heights or different things like that. So, in a sense, we checked, we surveyed all our major um, infrastructure and uh, opposed to all my colleagues that spoke about terrible problems before, in a sense, we believe it's not that anything could always be disturbed, but uh, it's easy to say or it's safely to say that when it comes to, to critical infrastructure, uh, our, the Israeli, uh, Israel's functional continuity is, as of now, is more or less okay. Okay, I'm, I'm careful with what I'm saying. Okay, it's more or less okay. We continue studying and surveying these different things. Am I out of time? You have one minute. Okay. So, uh, one, one more thing. In a sense, since I'm not, we're not any of those geeks that, were, uh, that I spoke about before, in a sense, how we solve a problem in real time. Okay, in a sense, we find out that there's a problem, we get it from the customers down below. When there's a problem with communications and we see it's in a certain area or aviation or any other kind of problem, we'll get it from the, uh, from the, um, from the critical infrastructure itself and then we will turn to our different colleagues. Also in the IDF, the IDF has a frequency branch, for instance, it's a unit that deals with these things. And we have our friends uh, in the National uh, Cyber uh, Directorate. And in a sense, we'll check that out and see where the problem is. Um, the problem could also be, by the way, uh, Omer before spoke about uh, 
a, a blue, how did you call it? Blue force. Okay. Well, the blue force could also be the different, the different jamming that we will be doing uh, as a country. In a sense, we have to be part of that and see that we can actually manage the, uh, continu the, the functional continuity in any kind of situation. Thank you. Yossi, thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you, Connie. That was a, a really, really, uh, really helpful survey. And it, again, we've, we're trying to leave quest time for questions, so we can start to think about questions for each one. Uh, Peter, it's your turn. You're up, and I'll just—I uh, uh, think everybody remembers who Peter is, yeah. reminding us that he's uh, Arian's vice president of customer affairs. Thank you. Yeah, it's getting late in the afternoon, but five minutes ago, I think you could still recognize me. <laughs> um, so I probably won't take the five minutes that, that are allotted because obviously I gave you some insights about the capabilities that, that we wanted to discuss. I would like to kind of refer to what, what you said with regards to contingency. Um, many of our customers today are engaging with us, obviously not only to look specifically at what GPS is, is doing, but to have a completely independent layer of surveillance. Right? So to have something that is completely delinked from all of your other infrastructure, obviously gives you a higher uh, level of, of reliability. And on top of that, it kind of goes I think without saying, because I showed you before, but having the insights, uh, not in your own airspace only, but more broadly than that. So you can literally look at what is happening across the world. You can check what is happening in Syria. You can check what is happening in China, in Russia, and kind of get, get some insights in that. Not only real time, which is obviously useful from a tactical standpoint, but if you want to look at more patterns or planning for specific missions or specific activities, you can kind of have a look and say, okay, what's been happening in the last year? What was the traffic from China to Israel, for example? Where did those, those aircrafts take off from? Um, and do, start to do analysis on that. So that's kind of introducing the, the big data concept into aviation that provides better insights from a security standpoint, border, uh, border security and, and cyber security on top of that. So, so Peter, I could, you, you've been very careful with your time. Um, I'd like to jump in with a question. And to, to what extent, I'm really wondering, to what extent there's, uh, you've had conversations with space, folk, space people about uh, adaptation of your model or a, a, a changed, enhanced version that would be helpful for space assets. Is there any kind of a conversation going on about that? So what we are actually, it's a good question, thank you. What we're actually looking at is, I mentioned the, the capability of doing IPV, independent position validation, which is basically uh, looking at uh, signals you get from multiple satellites, mm -hmm. and based on that, you can do triangulation. The next step of that, and I would be careful to say that's probably two, three years away, to actually be able to do what, what is called in the aviation world multilateration of a satellite, which doesn't only tell you, uh, okay, what's happening with that aircraft specifically, but allows you to do surveillance of, of aircraft that are even not, not, uh, not reporting uh, accurate, accurate positions. So that's an additional layer on top of that that we've been testing, but as everything, everything that we do is very, let's say, strict with regards to safety case. Again, you want an air traffic controller to be able to use the data to separate aircrafts. So before you kind of launch that type of new capability, of course, you need to have a full safety case. Uh, that is approved by local regulator and, and by EASA in our case before we implement it. So that's why it's like a two, three year window for that. Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, this, is, this is feeling a little bit like speed dating, but we're going <laughs> to continue. Not that we are familiar with that. <laughs> <laughs> speed. Excuse me? So <laughs> speed dating in space. To me. So, uh, Professor Boaz Ben Moshe has obtained, obtained his PhD in computer science from Ben Gurion University in 2004. After serving as a postdoc at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, he joined Ariel University as a faculty member in the Department of Computer Science. He heads the Aerospace and Nanosatellite Research Center and leads the Kinematics and Computational Geometry Lab, which focuses on autonomous robotics. His main research fields include navigation algorithms, 3D mapping, sensor fusion, autonomous robotics, edge AI, wireless sense. You're just trying to confuse us. Senseless sensor work with networks and new space. Since 2018, Professor Ben Moshe has served as the chair of the computer science department at Ariel University. So he's the co-founder of a few med tech companies. And we'd like to hear from you about your five minute take on what our challenges are right now. I had no idea that it would actually be read, but uh, okay. So. Um, I would like to use this stage for um, to suggest an initiative. Uh, 
relatively simple. As we all use Waze or Google Maps to um, basically plan our route. And obviously, it's not solving, per se, the, the traffic jams, but it gives you a perspective. And maybe you can do some sort of planning. And if on a, on a governmental point of view, you can say, OK, we need better road here and there. The same goes with the uh, heat map of the uh, GNSS jamming or, or spoofing to that extent. Um, a few of us, are, well, many of us are using our GPS. If uh, like 50% of the audience have a, uh, I don't know, like a Android, a modern Android phone, then they have a, a row measurements. You can do actually quite a lot with respect to what Omer mentioned and understand what is the average uh, uh, signal uh, interference. Obviously, if you're within a car, maybe you have uh, some sort of transmission within the car. You can be uh, uh, in some sort of uh, areas where it might be confusing. But the same goes with ways. You have a lot of scooters or, or walls or people who do driving the other way. But still, you get a good estimation. Same goes with, uh, with uh, estimating the uh, Genesis signal. And uh, I tried that uh, a few years back, almost a decade back, where we took uh, like uh, dozens of uh, simple phones, we wrote a simple uh, Android uh, 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 app, and we basically uploaded the data. And we could have, uh, we used uh, a, like um, it was like a uh, hundred meter uh, uh, pixel uh, size, but we were able to do a good jamming uh, heat map, uh, and it was dynamic, and it cost basically nothing. Well, a little bit of. Uh, energy for charging the phone, but basically it's nothing. The amount of data each user will do is very, very simple, and in that manner, I think it's uh, it's one initiative that I would be happy to, to join on a university, university level. And if I have another minute or yes, so, you do. Mm -hmm. the same goes with, uh, I have some, uh, uh, I'm an owner of a, of a little satellite, really, really small uh, uh, pocket cube, and we were unable to have a proper, uh, it's called SATLA 2. Uh, we we were unable to have a proper ground station because it costs a lot of money and we are sitting in Ariel University really, really close to a huge radar which has a, 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 our, our, our noise level is significantly higher than the, the, the signal. Anyway, so what we use is the the uh, amazing um, uh, initiative of uh, uh, called the Tiny GS. Uh, four people, I think, from Spain all have their day job, but they gather up and said, okay, if you are amateur radio, uh, um, uh, and they're expert amateur radio, really, really people who know what they're doing, um, just put your uh, the, the, the signals you, you receive into some sort of database, or you can do some sort of end-to-end -end encryption, it doesn't really matter, everything is being transmitted towards some sort of API to Telegram, it's a bit technical, but the beautiful thing is instead of having like 1% link budget, we have now like 25%, sometimes 30 or so uh, uh, link budget. It's mostly uh, something funny. And uh, we not necessarily need to do just receiving. We can do transmitting as well. So this, in the same method, think of that if we can take any other high school and put up a box with some sort of ADSB receiver in uh, strategic areas. You can have a resolution which could be a, in, a, in like in scales of a, a, like a few meters and you can do some analysis on the Doppler and you can use it for, to do this kind of uh, uh, um, learning physics or electronics or computer science in that matter and try to do, understand say the Doppler from the ADSB. There's quite a lot of things you can do with that and all as an education initiative. Basically the hardware is, is all, almost uh, uh, costless. So this is the, the other Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Very, very interesting. Um, our next speaker is Omer Bar. Um, and uh, he is, I believe, newly head of geo, at the geodesy department uh, at the uh, Survey of Israel. Is that right? So <clears throat> about a month? Uh, almost six months. But yeah. uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So uh, all the more experience that you can add to the conversation. So... Um, in terms of geoinformation and the, the, the uses that you have, can you discuss the workplace a little bit about the GNSS relevancy and where you see cyber vulnerabilities? So the Survey of Israel is a part of the Ministry of Housing and Construction. We own a, a operating 
this operating reference stations of GNSS receivers, which is unlike most of the projects here, are are stationary and not uh, and not I don't know <laughs> disappearing over space. And uh, and the, we receive the uh, the GNSS four constellations signals all the time, twenty four seven, which are being received in our in our facilities. And uh, we deliver precise positioning corrections for a lot of clients. And we have a good examples here in this panel from aviation through agriculture and uh, mostly use land surveyors and even uh, autonomy, autonomous uh, so vehicles. <clears throat> uh, so our basic needs for the uh, Genesis receivers and locations are not at the, uh, at the precisions of one meter. We usually talk about three to five millimeters at uh, positions, and the uh, positions of, of our network is what actually uh, creates the coordinate systems here in Israel. On the other hand, when we look at the, uh, uh, the project itself and we look at the receptions of these Genesis signals live from all of our 24-7 na nationwide spread, Stations, you can see the jamming and, in, and inter interferences live. So we have our uh, we have our sorry collaborations with numerous uh, um, uh, facilities, so we can actually help as a sensor, as a as a stationary ground sensors, and we report when we uh, have some interferences. The jamming. Although they're <laughs> interfering with our job, uh, they're interfering with a lot of engineering projects all over the, uh, the state. So the interferences are, are affecting us, but affecting everyone on ground and above ground, because we, as uh, we deliver the, uh, uh, the control points and the ground control for a lot of other projects, actually uh, becomes, I don't know, uh, some, something like uh, uh, irrelevant. Um, we try to uh, to to make our project a lot sustainable. Uh, currently, our our receivers are being updated with anti jamming capabilities, and we try as, as our our best to do what we can to help around. Thank you very much. You really disappointed. So, so our final speaker was connected to what you've just described. It's a bit of a, of a good surprise. Um, uh, in terms of uh, probably also as a person, but in terms of your professional engagement. So you have David Levy, and uh, that was uh, only because I don't know you yet enough. So David Levy is the CEO of the Israel Association of Field Crop Growers. The, uh, this association represents Israel's field crop farmers and promotes agricultural research pro uh, programs to advance, advance field crop agriculture in Israel. We know him, how important this sector is to the Israeli economy and to the Israeli ethos. Uh, please tell us the relevance of uh, a GPS GNSS to agriculture. Okay. First of all, I have an admission to make. I know nothing about GPS or cyber technology. <laughs> That's refreshing. Um, I do know a little bit about uh, farming and uh, agriculture. Um, Israel's uh, uh, field crop sector is approximately 200,000 hectares. Two million dunam, uh, and it's uh, about 50% of uh, Israel's farmland. Starting in about 2019, uh, our growers uh, started complaining uh, about experiencing uh, GPS disruptions causing both damage to crops and financial damage. You have to understand today that uh, there's a complete a uh, new uh, set of uh, agricultural machinery that is all using uh, GPS uh, technology for precision farming. The tractors all uh, come with GPSs, uh, harvesters, cotton pickers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is now loaded with uh, GPS equipment. And this is for uh, implementing um, uh, high-tech precision farming. So what we see, uh, and of course the, the, the farming techniques are for crop optimization and for reducing costs. And what we see, you know, and for precision planting, precision uh, uh, spraying,
harvesting and even precision irrigation. Um, when we have uh, shutdowns, it shuts down, it completely shuts down the agricultural machinery whereby the farmers cannot work. And uh, the shutdowns can go on for, if we're lucky, uh, several hours. And if we're not lucky, it could even go on for a week. Uh, there are different explanations uh, to the various disruptions that we have, whether uh, it's uh, some sort of uh, IDF maneuver or it's uh, some sort of disruption from across the borders or even uh, local uh, criminal disruptions of uh, criminals that apparently we also do some sort of interference in the GPS system so that uh, the farmers can't work either. Uh, we're in constant contact uh, with the, the various government agencies, uh, whether it's the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Communications, uh, the National Cyber uh, Directorate, and our dear friend uh, Kobe. Uh, the Israeli uh, Ministry of Agriculture Extension Service estimates that uh, the annual damage to Israeli agriculture because of these uh, disruptions is about 100 million shekels, which is about $25 million. Um, when there is a malfunction, of course, uh, we notify the authorities and we try to figure out uh, together what is causing the disruption uh, and what can be done to minimize the disruption or even uh, cancel this, the disruption. We had an issue like that not long ago where there was some sort of military maneuver and it was a very, very uh, important season for the farmers and uh, uh, with discussions uh, with uh, the Israeli military, uh, the maneuver was canceled for several days to enable the farmers mm -hmm. to uh, uh, complete uh, their plantings. Um, this year, um, this year, the Ministry of Agriculture has been giving grants to uh, the Israeli farmers to replace older antennas that are on the tractors with a newer generation of antennas that uh, reduce the shutdown time. Uh, this is not a, um, a real game changer, but it is definitely a bit of help uh, considering uh, the situation. What we need is uh, R&D. What we need is probably a different technology in our area, at least, but not in Israel, with all the uh, uh, military activity, uh, that we might need some sort of technology that may not be uh, GPS technology in order to continue uh, precision farming. Um, and that's what we really, really need. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Round of applause, please, for our panelists. And I think we have time for uh, two questions. Yes, ma'am. So if I can sort of try to focus in on that, thank you for the question. Um, so rather, so space asset to space asset, rather than the conversation, which is mostly up until now focused on uh, Earth, Earth sector to space sector. Is that? Do we have that right? Who'd like to take that? <laughs> You've stymied everybody. Um, I'll take a very, very short stab at it because obviously, we, in terms of capabilities, we are limited to the actual altitude of the satellite. Anything above that, of course, we cannot, we cannot capture. So we are looking into higher altitudes. Uh, Assets like UAVs, so we all know the, like the commercial smaller ones, but there's more and more work being done on higher altitude. Uh, so in that regard, we are looking at performance there, but anything beyond that, unfortunately, is not something we can capture. So I don't have a better answer for you than that. I'm sorry. No, I, I think it, I think it, the question is very, is uh, I think a very very good one and a very challenging one. We talked about a, earlier on the, the, the very very new challenges. And I think a lot of it, uh, one of the basic questions is whether uh, moon to space to International Space Station communications will be GNSS or some other technology. And I'm sure there's an answer to that uh, possibly in this room. Anybody want to take a stab at that? We've written it down for the record. Thank you very much. Uh, are we all set? 
Okay, I'm afraid we don't have time for any more questions, but please, please feel free to approach the panelists and ask them as you will. Thank you. Have a very pleasant evening in Tel Aviv. David, what's the need to combine this? Guys, just uh, one moment to, to thanks to the people. Okay, thank you. Uh, Guys, I would like to thank uh, to the lectures and the participants in the panels, the chairing without the knowledge. Please, one minute. Special thanks to Gil Drew Bevstein, Roni Sharir, Rotem Biran, and my partner, uh, Nive David, for organizing these special sessions for cyber defense in space, in space. Thank you so much for the audience. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Thank you.